Welcome to Just a Minute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it's my pleasure to welcome our many listeners in this country and, of course, around the world, but also to welcome to the program this week four exciting, talented people who are going to pit their wits and their humor and show their verbal dexterity and ingenuity as they try and speak on a subject that I give them and do that without hesitation, repetition or deviation. And those four people are seated on my right, Tony Hawks and Clement Freud, and seated on my left, June Clary and Kate Robbins. Will you please welcome all four of them? And beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who's going to help me with the score, and she'll blow a whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Shaw Theatre, a delightful new establishment here, right in the centre of Bloomsbury area of London, not very far from St Pancras Station. And we've got a lot of people who just got off the train and rushed in here to <laughs> cheer us on our way as we play Just a Minute and start the show with Clement Freud. Clement, the subject here to start the show is My Headmaster. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game starting now? When I was a very small boy and went to a progressive boarding school in Devon, my headmaster's name was Bill. I tried to call him William, but he wouldn't have it. <laughs> he was not good at his job. He wrote books about problem children. And while we were around getting drunk, he went on scribing his parchment in order to do the publications which I have just mentioned. He had a tremendous favorite, a girl called Rachel Long. And if you have someone whom you love beyond all other people in a school, I've said school. <laughs> Tony, you challenge then. Uh, re repetition of something. I can't remember what it was. No, school. That was it. No, school. we were so captivated by yes, the story and about good. Rachel Long. I yes. think we all wanted to know what happened to Rachel. Yes. And uh, we were She's waiting. Here. Rachel Long is here. In this audience In tonight. In the audience, yes. She must be pretty ancient by now if she was. Uh... <laughs> no, because she'd be older than Clement. I mean, for legally, for the headmaster to have a crush on one of the pupils, it must have been one of the over, older pupils. And Clement is not in his first flush. <laughs> so if you look at it logically, I wasn't making... We are a... watching a man digging himself out of... <laughs> I hope my digging was profitable. <laughs> Tony, you had a correct challenge, so you get a point for that, and you take over the subject with 24 seconds to go. My headmaster starting now. When I was at school, I got into terrible trouble with my headmaster for organising a game of just a minute in the classroom. And it was against the rules, and no one ever did it in the schools up and down the country because it was considered to be passé and just something that should... Uh, Clement Challenge. Repetition. Of what? Just... Oh, yes. yes, just a minute. Just. Oh, yes. yes, well spotted. Well, listen, Clement, and you've got the subject back with seven seconds to go. My headmaster starting now. My headmaster was sacked in 1993 <laughs> for running an establishment which nobody cared for. In this game, whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Clement Freud. And at the end of that round, you naturally have realised he's in the lead with two points. Tony has one, the other two have yet to score. But, Kate, we're going to hear from you now. Kate Robbins, will you take the subject of kids? 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. Kids are so cute. I'm talking about the bearded and hairy variety. Of course, the offspring of goats. That's the kids I'm discussing at the moment. Do not try to eat the meat of this beast, however. It is vile, particularly as I'm vegetarian. And if you like the milk of this beast... Oh. <laughs> Julian, you challenged. Well, it was going to be a repetition, but then it was a hesitation. That's and right. And it was and nearly a swear word. we call that here. <laughs> And so, Julian, you have kids, you have uh, 42 seconds available, starting now. Thank you very much. I'm planning to move to the countryside, and I'm hoping, hoping to get some... <laughs> Okay, challenge. Yeah, I'll have my kids nice. back, please. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you yes, just I hesitated. Think, I think we would interpret that as hesitation. Kate, so you have got kids back with you, and you have 37 seconds starting now. Kids can ruin your life. Never mind it, make it more enchanting. I have three, and they drive me round the... <laughs> Tell you, challenge. Well, I don't think she was actually going to say what, what it was she was being driven round. I think it was a hesitation. 
It was a hesitation. I was going to say dr- round the wall. But you go oh. up a wall, don't you? Yes. Why didn't you go round the You could have bend? said bend. You hadn't said it before. Because I'm scared to say any word beginning with B on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if I repeat B, B, yes. and then C. Ah, I see what you mean. You can go round the wall, though, if you wish. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I was going to go round a wall, so yes. give it back to me. Well, no, 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 no. Certainly you're making it quite hard for yourself yes. by avoiding mm. words beginning with B as well. <laughs> And unfortunately, you stopped, so Tony had a correct challenge, and he now has 30 seconds to tell us something about kids starting now. Kids have it tough. The best thing about being an adult is that as many of you as you want can go into a news agent at any one time. <laughs> that is fantastic, and how I love to flaunt this advantage I have over kids by mocking them as they are lined up outside, waiting individually to be invited in by the proprietor of that establishment. <laughs> And when they go in, I say... Uh, Clement Charles. Go in, twice. I'm afraid you went in too yes. often, yes. <laughs> go in, go in, and Clement's clever to go in with five seconds to go on. Kids, Clement, starting now. Children are quite often referred to as kids. You might say, hello, you kids. We uh, <laughs> challenge. I saw the whistle. I know you did. I must explain to our listeners, Clement Paul's for only one reason then, because he saw Janet put the whistle up to her mouth and she was going to blow it. <laughs> and she was getting ready to blow it, but not actually blowing it. So, Kate, so you I got blew in first. So I blew it. <laughs> You've gone in with a hesitation with one second to go, kids starting now. Kids do not have... Robin, speaking as a whistle gained an extra point, and uh, Kate, uh, was, it's only the second time she's played the game, and uh, last time she was struggling a little, but this time she's now in the lead with Clement Freud at the end of that round. And, uh, <laughs> Julian Clary, will you take the next round? The subject is lip service. Will you tell us something about <laughs> lip service? <laughs> oh. Where did this audience come from? <laughs> And it's lip service with you, Julian, starting now. If I pay you lip service, then I am indeed servicing you with my lips. That's <laughs> what you're laughing about, and don't pretend that wasn't the reason. I think generally, though, it means a disingenuous or insincere phrase. Uh, Kate, challenge. I think you meant disingenuous. Yes, and what do you I know what I meant. <laughs> said disingenuous. That's right. So it is a deviation from English as we know it and understand it. <laughs> You've got so the hang of it now, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kate, you've got the hang of it. As Julian said, you've got 45 seconds. Tell us something about lip service starting now. I once stayed in a hotel where you had lip service to your room if you wanted it. You rang down and you... Uh, Julian, challenge. Could I have the address? <laughs> Oh, Julian, <laughs> the mind boggles. We we'll give you a bonus point because the audience enjoyed your challenge. But it wasn't really a challenge, it was an interruption. But Kate gets a point because she was interrupted. She keeps lip service and she doesn't keep lip service, she keeps the subject of lip service. And there are 39 seconds at starting now. Lip service would be a great name for a collagen clinic. Uh, Julian challenge. Hesitation. She did stumble over collagen, didn't she? Collagen clinic, yes. That's right. right, yes. So, Julian, you've got it back again. You've got 35 seconds. Lip service starting now. I'm now going to pay lip service to every member on this panel. Kate, I've always admired your work. Nicholas, you're looking younger every week. <laughs> Clement, how long has it been since we last met for tea in Bloomsbury? I can't remember. <laughs> and Tony, what a lovely top. Is it blue? <laughs> What particular fibre is that made from? And now let's start with the audience. Oh, there's a man in the front row with ginger hair. Well, you don't see that very often. <laughs> nice if you're going to a party, I always think. And the man behind you is chewing something. <laughs> Tony. A repetition of man, I think. I mean, yes. Yes, I like to repeat men. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tony, you've got in with two seconds to go. Oh. They wanted to hear more about the audience, too. Lip service is with you, Tony, starting now. I suspect that my challenge wasn't that. <laughs> well, at the end of that round, Tony Hawkes, the speaker, as a whistle when gained an extra point, but he's still one point behind our leader, who is Kate Robbins. So... <laughs> With you, Kate. Uh, and uh, Tony Hawkes, it's your turn to begin. The subject is the glass ceiling. 
Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. The glass ceiling that I have fitted to my kitchen is not very popular, largely because the room above is the bathroom. <laughs> I particularly like to go in there knowing that I might be making a cup of tea down below and glancing upwards, uh, as if one might even be looking at a blue plaque that was above someone in a building. <laughs> Uh, Clement Challenge. I was saving him. Yes. <laughs> I think he was drowning and the water was dripping through his glass ceiling. Uh, Clement, you have 40 seconds. Tell us something about the glass ceiling starting now. The glass ceiling was one of the very few unexceptionally bad films made by the Ealing Studios. And the reason why none of you have heard of it or perhaps seen it is because it never came out. They worked on it day after night, week into months, for years. And yet the quality was so astonishingly poor that the glass ceiling hit the bin in which... OK, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I think mean, I'm digging you out I'm, a bit now, Clem. Yes, I think he was... <laughs> he was only struggling with, with such rubbish as well. <laughs> <laughs> but he's got such a convincing air, you're all carried away with it. I'm a contemporary of his, and I know that the eating students never made a glass scene. Anyway, doesn't matter. Hitting a film when it's down is... is <laughs> really... Hitting a film that never surfaced, I think, is... Uh, anyway, Kate, done. you had a correct challenge, you saved him, and 13 seconds on the glass ceiling starting now. The glass ceiling that you'll find at Kew Gardens is amazing. It, of course, covers all the beautiful plants that are there and is now a term used in the ozone... L <laughs> It's only oh, oh. Was there a slight hesitation? <laughs> no, there wasn't. You mustn't be put off by them. No. I, I know he made a noise, and mm. I saw you look at him. I know, but I like him, you see. <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't why you looked at him. You no. looked at him because he was, thought he was putting know. you off. <laughs> Quite nice looking. Once again, he's got him. What's your challenge? Uh, hesitation. I'm so, I don't want to repeat the challenge. I'll get done for repetition. <laughs> I don't think you did. You, no. you struggled a bit, but you don't actually... Uh, no, you didn't really hesitate. No, no, no. <laughs> anyway, the benefit of the doubt on that one, uh, and I'll have to redress the balance if it happens, as the glass ceiling is still with you, Kate, starting now. The glass ceiling in my bedroom was supposed to be a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> so Kate Robbins with the game, speaking as a whistle went, and it's increased her lead at the end of the round. And Clement Freud, your turn to begin. The subject is <laughs> penguins. Tell us something about those creatures in this game starting now. A penguin is a flightless seabird that looks astonishingly like a nun. There are <laughs> ordinary penguins, but also emperor penguins and fairy penguins, which I thought just might please some... <laughs> Fair challenge. You're really hesitating this time, aren't you? He did hesitate, you did. yes. He was and... looking at me as he said fairy significantly. <laughs> What's your point, Clement? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Right, outside. <laughs> so, Kate, another point to you. 44 seconds available. Tell us something about penguins starting now. Penguins do very bad impressions of people going to balls where Geoffrey Archer does auctions, wearing tuxedos. These places are not very good for penguins to actually go to. They are places... Oh. oh. Tony Challenge. Uh, repetition of places. Places, correct, Tony. Another point to you. 33 seconds, penguins starting now. A penguin is a bird that cannot fly. What is the point of that? That's like being a prime minister who can't mislead his people. <laughs> Heaven forfend, that will never happen. Uh, Clement Challenge. That was the fourth that. Yeah, he did. Yes, there were, there were four that's. Um, yes, can't that. We don't that, like that, 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 that. stuff. <laughs> so for that reason, he's got the challenge. Yes. Okay. So we give it to Clement. <laughs> Benefit of the doubt, perhaps, but it's yours. 21 seconds, penguins starting now. Penguins quite like the cold when it snows, freezes. Oh, uh, Julian Challenge. Fairy penguins don't. <laughs> Julian, if there are such things, I think they're like all other penguins and they probably do enjoy the cold. So we give you a bonus point because we enjoyed what you said and the interruption means that Clemmer gets a point and he has uh, 17 seconds on penguins starting now. Penguin in French is penguin. In German, penguin. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> no. <laughs> 
And have you got a challenge in the rules of just a minute, Tony? Uh, yeah, I'm struggling a bit. Uh, <laughs> yes, go on. Um, deviation. No, he wasn't deviating. He well, hesitated. he made a definite statement that it was interesting. I think we all in this room <laughs> agree that that was an incorrect No, statement. you've just got to laugh because you're a good timer of comedy. Uh, yes. But he, he hesitated. You didn't well, have I'll him for that. Well, I'll being a good you timer had him. of comedy then. <laughs> you had Coming him from for... you, that is a wonderful thing to hear. <laughs> So I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy, listen, I'm happy with the compliment, and I'm, I'm happy not to get a point. In fact, I'm over the moon about everything. <laughs> and we're delighted to have you on the show. Splendid. <laughs> right, so I, I consider it's an incorrect challenge, Clement. You still have penguins, and ten seconds, starting now. Penguins are tremendously attractive to zoos. I really have a lot else to say about <laughs> penguins, but we'll leave it to Nicholas Parsons, who is... <laughs> So, Clement Freud, speaking as a whistle when gained an extra point with others in the round, he has leapt forward. He's now equal with Kate Robbins at the end of the round, followed by Tony Hawkes and Julian Clary in that order. And, Kate, it's your turn to begin. The subject is chalk and cheese. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. Chalk and cheese sandwiches were what I ate when I was pregnant for the third time. It was a delicious mixture of alkaline and acid, which is contrary to the idea of chalk and cheese being very different and not going together very well. I enjoyed this delicacy because I was craving weird things. That's what happens to women when they're gestationally... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> June in charge. A hesitation yes. in the middle of your gestation. Yes. <laughs> right, that's the problem of the game, isn't it? Once you try to find another word to express something you've already said, and there's very few other ways of saying pregnant. Right, um, 37 seconds, Julian, on chalk and cheese, starting now. Anne Widdicombe and Kate Moss, Clement <laughs> Freud and Julian Clary, these are examples of chalk and cheese, people from opposite ends of the spectrum, so far apart that it's hard to imagine them, imagine them having anything. Uh, Tony totally challenged. Uh, it's like hesitation on that. There the was imagine. a slight hesitation, Ju um, Tony, so you have chalk and cheese and you have uh, 22 seconds starting now. Ten years ago, Nicholas Parsons asked me if I wanted to be in a double act called Chalk and Cheese. I said, what am I going to be he said you will be chalk and obviously he would have to be the other one and I didn't agree to this because I thought I was a master of comic timing as we've already established earlier in this show <laughs> and that he might not be able to keep pace. Uh, Clement Challenge. The repetition might. Might yes you did say might before. Uh, Clement you've got a correct challenge and you have got um, three seconds to go mm. on chalk and cheese starting now. I went to a restaurant called the Fromagerie and asked for chalk. <laughs> And McFloyd was speaking as the whistle went again and gained that extra point and his increased his lead by two over Kate Robbins and then comes Tony Hawks and Julian Clary. Julian, it's your turn to begin and the subject is Bernard Shaw. A lot of people may not know that this theatre, the Shaw Theatre, was named after that great playwright. Oh. And you have 60 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Are you Shaw? Sure? Anyway, um, Bernard Shaw. 60 seconds, Julian, starting now. Bernard Shaw was a cheery man with a very long beard who passed his days writing plays which were very successful, generally speaking, and put on in the West End to great acclaim. He was as far removed from Oscar Wilde as it's possible to be. They were chalk and cheese. <laughs> I think he lived an awfully long time. I think... Uh, Tony Hawk's challenge. Well, I think it is possible to be more... He did say that they were about as opposed as it was possible to be, Oscar Wilde. No, no they were. Their style was different. No, but well, one of them could have been a, you know, a, a, you know <laughs> worked as a dustman. One of them could have been a Flemish dustman. Oh, <laughs> shut when up. When it came to writing plays, they were almost as chalk and cheese. By a stretch of the imagination, you could say that. One wrote those smart, witty, clever comedies, and the other ones wrote social pamphleteer-type plays with a social conscience. And uh, uh, there wasn't much of a social conscience in... Uh... I sense this ruling isn't going my way. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got the benefit of the doubt, even if you don't agree with me. Okay. So, Bernard Shaw is still with you, Julian, and there are 39 seconds starting now. Bernard Shaw had a very formidable intellect, and if you sat in his company before long, he'd come out with a bon mot that you could treasure and take home and tell your grandchildren. <laughs> Bernard Shaw told me that. He's still very popular today. In fact, just up the road in the West End, there's a play of his, which I have seen. Um, um, uh, repetition of play? Uh, yeah. No, he was plays before he wrote plays. Oh. 
Ooh. And there was different as chalk and cheese. I think that was what it was, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> listen, so I can't listen. wait to take this and listen back to this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 20 seconds. We're still with you, Julian Bernard Shaw, starting now. It's come back to me now. The performance I have seen is called You Never Can Tell. And it's stunning. I, in fact, I reviewed it for a well-known periodical, and I gave it five stars, which I don't hand out very often. I'm very stingy with my stars, but... Uh, Kate Challenge. I'm afraid you said stars twice. Yes, you had too many stars. I know for someone like you, uh, stars are right. Kate, you've got him with four seconds. <laughs> To go on uh, Bernard Shaw starting now. Bernard Shaw was a lad in my class at school, little Bernie Shaw. He was a real hard case. And... <laughs> so Kate Robbins was then speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point, and she's leapt back into the lead, but alongside Clement Freud, and in second place, equal are Julian Clary and Tony Hawkes. Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject is now the art of flower arranging. Tell us something about that art in this game, or that subject in this game, starting now. The art of flower arranging is something George Bernard Shaw was very keen on. I'm awfully pleased because I was going to speak about this man earlier. He was born in 1856. <laughs> which is... Uh, Kate's challenge. Deviation. Yes. He's talking about Bernard Shaw, and we were supposed to be talking about the art of flower arranging. Which yes. he did. Well, that's... I no. he was one of Come the... Come on. Yes, but you did actually say that you were going to now talk about Bernard Shaw. Which is who was one of the great flower arrangers. <laughs> <laughs> no, you said he was good at flower arranging, yes. but I'm now going to talk about Bernard Shaw. The so I... number one flower arranger. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't s in Buckinghamshire. I th in a, to my mind, you established that you were now going to go on to the subject that we'd had before yes. with Bernard Shaw and not... What did we have, Bernard Shaw? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I often give benefits of the doubt. Kate, you have the benefit of the doubt on... And so you have the art of flower arranging and you have 47 seconds starting now. The art of flower arranging is something the Women's Institute like to do quite a lot of, and it's something I am not very good at because I always put chrysanthemums in, which apparently don't look very nice in the arrangement of flowers in a... <laughs> Julian, you challenge first. Hesitation, Hesitation suddenly, yes. inexplicably. <laughs> Tell us something about the art of flower arranging, <clears throat> Julian, with uh, 33 seconds to go, starting now. I don't go in for flower arranging myself. I choose tulips whenever possible, particularly popular at this time of the year, because you pop them in a vase, come downstairs the next morning, and do you know, they've arranged themselves. <laughs> and as the days pass, they lean towards the window, saying, I'm over here, sunlight, and it's delightful. It's like having a budgie or a parrot. <laughs> Every time you walk in the room, there's something different going on with the tulips. <laughs> Red ones. Uh, Clement tulips. Charles. Tulips. tulips. Tulips, yes, you can't repeat the subject. Uh, the, the, the flower. Right, six seconds, you're back with you, Clement. The art of flower arranging starting now. In Japan, they're tremendously keen on it. Go to... Um, Julian Challenge. On what? George <laughs> Bernard Shaw? <laughs> <laughs> Only because you've got a round of applause, Julian, will I give you a bonus point because they enjoyed the interruption, but he wasn't deviating from the art of flower arranging. So, Clement, you've got another point, and you've got three seconds on the subject starting now. Even on the train from Tokyo to Kyoto, there is a flower arranging. <laughs> yeah. So, at the end of that round, uh, I have to tell you, by the way, we're moving into the last round. And uh, Julian Clary and Tony Hawkes, who have won in the past in this game, are equal together in third place. They are about three points behind Kate Robbins, who's only played the game twice. And this is her second time, by the way. But just out in the lead is Clement Freud, as we move into this final round. And it's Kate Robbins to begin. The subject is fibs. Kate, tell us something about fibs in just a minute, starting now. FIBS is an acronym for, sorry about this, Clement, Freudian inference of believable stories, meaning lies, something I have never, ever told in my life. There you are. There's one for you now. <laughs> Obviously, when in court, you can't refer to, I never did any fibbing, Your Honour. I never... <laughs> <sighs> 
Tony Hawk's challenge. Yes, repetition of never. Uh, never, yes, well done. T Fibs is with you, Tony, and there are 47 seconds starting now. The Glass Ceiling was a tremendous Ealing comedy that never got released. That would be an example of a fib, I believe. But Clement pulled it off with some aplomb because he is an excellent fibber on this show. Heaven forfend, I'm not saying he would do it outside of this arena. Um, uh, Kate Challenge. I didn't understand you meant, <laughs> heaven forfend. <laughs> I have no head. I think that he was keeping going. It might sound like hesitation. I have no head. No, I'm sorry. He, he sounded like a pop singer. He got the words singer. out, but he's. He... <laughs> No, I, I think we must give him the benefit of the doubt on this occasion. Okay. And so he keeps the subject of fibs. And Tony, there are 26 seconds starting now. Fourteen people are in the audience this evening. That could be an example of a fib. We all know from the reaction that we're hearing, the enthusiasm to my voice, that there are over 25 of these lovely demonstrating it as I speak. We really hear them cry out. Kate, you challenged You got one. so carried away then that you did hesitate in the middle of your <laughs> triumphal speech. <laughs> Actually, he didn't hesitate until after you pressed your buzzer. <laughs> oh. No, he did a bit. He, he went, did a bit. how'd you have? <laughs> no, he was, he has the benefit of the doubt again. He, he was rising the audience. Uh, you have uh, uh, seven seconds to go on FIBS with you, Tony, starting now. I'm not sure if FIBS actually is an acronym, as Kate was stating earlier. It may well be her imagination. <laughs> give you the final score. That was uh, Julian Clary, who has won in the past on occasions, did very well, but he did finish, unfortunately, in fourth place. But we love having you, Julian. Your contribution is invaluable. And uh, in second place, uh, someone who's only played the game once before is Kate Robbins, who did magnificently on her return visit. Tony Hawkes, who won the last time we were at the Shaw Theatre, finished up on a magnificent um, a place in second place, but he was two points behind Clement Freud. So, Clement, we say this week you are our winner. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. We hope you've enjoyed. This edition of Just a Minute, it only remains for you to say thank you to these four delightful players of the game, Julian Cleary, Tony Hawkes, Kate Robbins and Clement Freud. I thank Janet Staplehurst who has helped me with the score, she'd blown a whistle magnificently when the 60 seconds elapsed, and we thank our producer-director Claire Jones, we're indebted to Ian Messiter who's created this game, and we're very grateful to this lovely audience here at the Shaw Theatre in Euston Road who've cheered us on our way. We hope the listeners have enjoyed it, so from me, Nicholas Parsons and our team, goodbye, tune in! The next time we play, just a minute. <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute walls fades away, once more it's my pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country, but throughout the world, but also to welcome to the show four exciting, experienced, and distinctive players of this game, who've come together to show their verbal wits and ingenuity as they try and speak on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. And seated on my right, we have Paul Merton with Clement Freud, and seated on my left, Graham Norton with Jenny Eclair. Will you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> and seated beside me, Janet Staplehurst, who's going to help me with the score. She's going to blow a whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Harley Quinn Theatre, that cultural centre <laughs> of Red Hill. <laughs> I was told that as we came in, and here we have a red-hot Red Hill audience ready to enjoy themselves as we begin the show with Clement Freud. Clement, the first subject is the wow factor. What a lovely subject. 60 seconds, starting now. What I have in common with Red Hill is that the wow factor <laughs> plays an astonishingly small part in my life. Our lives, perhaps, that should have been. 
A factor is someone who looks after things. Wow factoring, in my case, is of little import. <laughs> There's Paul hardly challenged. a wow Paul is in Kevin. me. <laughs> Look where you will. You've still been challenged, Kevin. Hesitation. Yes, I think he was on autopilot then. <laughs> uh, yes, a hesitation, Paul, a correct challenge. So you get a point for a correct challenge, you take over the subject, which is the wow factor. There are 36 seconds available, and you start now. People in show business are always looking for the next wow factor, aren't they? The new musical, or perhaps a brand... <laughs> I say new again. I can say new again. Yeah. Graham, you challenge. Uh, yeah, hesitation. I hesitation, think. yes, Graham. So you're going to talk on the wow factor as well. And there are uh, 30 seconds available starting now. The architect of this Harlequin theatre certainly knew what the wow factor was. <laughs> oh, if only you could see it. It has all the Rococo splendor of a paving slab. <laughs> I believe it was purpose built. 1975 to house Council State, the musical. <laughs> or perhaps it was just left over from that festival of bricks you had in Red Hill in <laughs> the same decade. Its reddish brown charm cannot be overestimated. <laughs> In this game, whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Graham Norton, and he's got two points at the end of the round. Paul Merton has one. And, uh, Graham, we'd like you to take the next round. The subject is envy. Tell us something about that deadly sin, or take it any way you like, of course. 60 seconds, starting now. As I enjoyed one of the several roundabouts one encounters on the way into this fair <laughs> town, I was stunned. When I saw Envy, the nightclub, <laughs> it's me. I wanted to park and run in and have a dance. Imagine Justin Timberlake and Cameron Diaz in some New York hotspot. They can't really enjoy it now because in the back of their mind they're thinking, damn Red Hill, and it's Envy. I want to be there. That's uh, the place uh, I want. Sorry, uh, Paul has challenged you. Cause... Yeah, a repetition of Red Hill. Oh, yeah. Because you drove... funny. A word I've never said before. <laughs> You didn't notice you're saying it again as you drove into Red Hill at the beginning. Uh, Paul, you have a correct challenge. You have the subject of envy. 28 seconds are starting now. I suppose there is a lot of rivalry in these places outside of London. I once saw an advert at the station of Hemel Hempstead. It said, hard luck, London. I've got to say London again. That's so good. Yeah. <laughs> Jenny challenge? Yes, he did say London twice. Yes, yes, did you yes, hear he him? Did. Yes, he did. Well, you heard him, which is an important yeah, thing. I did. And you pressed your buzzer first. So you have envy to talk on, uh, talk about, I should say. 19 seconds starting now. I suffer terribly <coughs> from envy every time I turn on the television and see an advert that doesn't have my voiceover. I think, why did they employ that? piece of rubbish. It should have been me. The trouble with be being eaten up. Uh, a Paul challenge. Bit of a hesitation. Bit of a hesitation, yes. yes. And um, uh, you've yes. got him with three seconds to go ah. forward. I do apologise. I, I must be a great disappointment to you all. Mm. <laughs> But uh, it's slightly it was, was apologising, actually, for getting in with only three seconds to go, which was very, very, very thoughtful of him. And um, so now you have the three seconds, Paul, uh, subject envy, and you start now. I can't help but feel that those people who are booing me now are... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Paul Merton was then speaking as the whistle went gained that extra point, and he's now in the lead, head of Graham Norton and Jenny Eclair and Clement Freud in that order. And Jenny, will you take the next round? Grumpiness. Tell us something about <laughs> grumpiness in just a minute, starting now. I'm so thrilled to be grumpy. It gives me the greatest excuse to go round with a face like a hammerhead shark, waving my fist at everyone. Anything can trigger me off. I get up in the morning, stub my toe, drop myself into the bath. The water's not hot, it's cold. Next thing, buttons are dropping off my new expensive cardigan. I trap my hand in my knicker drawer. My tights are laddered. I go down Stairs, the dishwasher has flooded. Oh, God, oh, how challenge. hard. Have you, <laughs> have you sought professional help? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
ball. Uh, do, have you got a challenge within the rules of just a minute? No. But... no, no, no. He was no. just trying to help me. Well, no, no, we, we enjoyed the interruption. So Paul gets a bonus point for that. Jenny was interrupted, so she gets a point for that. She keeps the subject of envy. No, wait, we had that before, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> Let me do grumpy. Yes, it's grumpy. So you've gone for envy. We've got grumpiness. 32 seconds starting now. Here are some more things that make me grumpy. Think... Uh, Graham Challenge. Is that a repetition of grumpy? Yes, because grumpiness oh, yeah. is the subject on the card, yeah, and you yeah, use the I word grumpy. grumpy, yes. I'll get it back. <laughs> uh, uh, audience, those are the rules of the game. <laughs> Graham, listen, got a correct challenge. 39 seconds, grumpiness, Graham, starting now. If grumpiness looked like something, I believe it would be this lady sitting to my right. It also has a smell. You probably can't get it where you're sitting. But, ooh, it's rank where I am. Grumpiness is a very odd thing, I feel. Grumpiness, there, I said it again, because I can. It's the subject. I know it's making me annoyed, Ms. Eclair. I've probably said Eclair. But, uh, Paul challenge. Repetition of Eclair. Eclair, yes. Right. And I didn't even pick up on it. <laughs> so, uh, Paul, a correct challenge. And you got in a game with three seconds to go. And no, it doesn't matter. That, that is the game. He wasn't deliberately trying to get in just before the end. It just happened that he repeated something. Three seconds. Grumpiness, Paul, starting now. The incredible sulk as he goes up the stairs is the most grumpy of them all. So Paul Martin was again speaking as the whistle went again. That extra point for doing so has increased his lead at the end of the round. And Paul, we'd like you to begin the next round. And the subject now is grasping the nettle. Tell us something about that subject in this game starting now. I'm not very good at gardening. I like the results, but I don't actually know what you do to make it look like that way. But I think grasping the nettle means that you must face the situation. You have to... <laughs> Any challenge? Yeah, he was jib gibbering then, wasn't he? No, he you know, wasn't. Hesitating. No, Hes he was just hesitated He's once. He's hesitating. Everything else he said was very coherent. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, OK. I you might want to rubbish the, the other no, people. No, no, I didn't. Darling. No, we're, but he took my grumpiness off me. <laughs> Jenny, nobody can take your grumpiness off you. <laughs> it's in your DNA. <laughs> but you've got the subject now of grasping the nettle. 51 seconds available starting now. Unlike kittens and babies, you have to grasp the nettle firmly round the neck. Grasp it round its neck like... Uh, James Charles. Uh, repetition of neck. neck. Yes. <laughs> you did. Uh, I didn't want it anyway. <laughs> no. Graham, you've got him with 41 seconds available, grasping the nettle starting now. Stroke a nettle, it will sting you. But grasping it, it's not supposed to. But growing up in Ireland in the country, it does. It's just a load of old rubbish. <laughs> then you run and find a dock leaf which grows in the hedgerow sewer or other thing by verge. <laughs> oh, there was hesitation there. There was hesitation. hesitation in the not. sewer? Was... Dock leaves don't grow in sewer. I was just painting a word picture. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was lovely, but you hesitated, so Paul, talk now. You get the subject back, grasping the nettle, 23 seconds, starting now. The stings don't affect you if you grasp it really hard. That's the idea. Faced with a difficult situation, you must decide to be firm, walk tall, as Val Dunican used to sing. Look the world right in the eye. And that's what you must do. Grasp the nettle, show that you're not afraid of it. You are the... A Clement Challenge. Nine U's. <laughs> I wonder why your head was... Oh, that's right. I, I, Clement's written down the number nine. Now I believe him. <laughs> I see nine, yeah. Uh, I mean, I will explain to my listeners that Clemens' head was bowed during that, and I wondered who was nodding off, but he wasn't. He, he was actually counting. So, correct challenge, Clemens. Six seconds, grasping the nettle, starting now. Grasping the nettle is about masochism, something which I'm particularly keen on. So, Clement Freud was speaking as the whistle went gain that extra point, and he's now in fourth place. But he's just behind uh, Graham and Jenny, and uh, Paul's and Merton's in the lead. And Clement, you begin the next round for us. A lovely subject for you, grey power. Tell us something about grey power in this game, starting now. 
Power could be almost any color, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. But gray power means the power is vested in people of a certain age, those whose hair might well have gone from black to white. And in Australia, they actually have a political party called the Grey. And those are the most dangerous people because their only intention in seeing through legislation in the equivalent of our House of Commons. Jenny, you challenged. Oh, there was a pause. There was a pause, a strong mm. pause, right. So, Jenny, you have grey power, 27 seconds, starting now. Grey power is when wrinklies all gang together and start demanding stuff like over 50 swimming and free perms on the national health, <laughs> public transport for nothing. The closer one gets to being a pensioner, of course, the more this makes sense. Uh, Graham challenged. I think repetition of pensioner. No, it's your own I said wrinkly. No, 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 the free perms for pensioners. Pen yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've forgotten. God, I'm really close to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Graham, 12 seconds for you to tell us something about grey power starting now. Grey power conjures up an image of a whole army of pensioners marching on the young uns, overpowering them with potpourri and tying them in large lacy doilies <laughs> with the ladies of crocheting cats. So, Graham Norton speaking as the whistle again, gained that extra point, and with others in the round, he is moving forward, he's creeping up on our leader, Paul Merton, he's only two behind him, and, uh, Jenny, we'd like you to take the next round for starters. It is, uh, my singing voice, not mine, you can take the subject anyway you like, my singing voice, 60 seconds, starting now. My singing voice has got something wrong with it. Apparently, I have over hairy, large larynx for a woman, which stops me from hitting high notes. This is combined with tone deafness. I don't think it's very funny. In fact, I think it's a medical condition which should let me park on double yellow. So there. <laughs> in fact, in my passport, under distinguishing features, it says mole on top of left thigh and can't sing. Actually, this does depress me. Last year, I did a charity gig for Comic Relief, and I went into Fame Academy, and I tried my hardest, and I did a song from Chicago and a song from another musical. People were really horrible Paul, to me. Paul, Paul is challenging. Paul. A repetition of song. Yeah, yeah song. You yeah, think came to me? shouldn't do songs. Right. So, Paul, you've got my singing voice, and you have 24 seconds starting now. You are my honey, honey suck. Honey and honeysuckle are two words. Jenny, you challenge. I made a fool of myself. <laughs> honey and honeysuckle. Yes, honeysuckle's a, a word, so Paul, incorrect challenge, 19 seconds. Uh, subject of my singing voice starting now. I remember the occasion as if it was yesterday. The Albert Hall was in stunned silence. Nigel Kennedy had just put... Uh, Clement challenge. The Albert Hall was closed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he, he's right, it was closed. He's right, it was. I thought it was quiet. Yeah, but it doesn't mean to say that you may, were not there. Perhaps. There was one bloke there, I thought, as long as he sits there, I'd entertain him. At the end, he right said, we've got to be much longer, I've got to lock it up. Right. <laughs> but, Bill, within the rules of just a minute, you could still have been in the Albert Hall, mm. you could still have had it closed, you could still have been doing that. Absolutely. And, uh, Clement, we enjoyed the interruption. Bonus point to you, but Paul has a point for being interrupted. He keeps the subject. 14 seconds, my singing voice starting now. Suddenly, the conductor of the London Philharmonic Orchestra had looked me straight in the eye, and I realised this was my solo. I couldn't let him down. I'd been training for the past seven months. The first verse you could hear in the very back row, and I went, whoa! So Paul was speaking as the whistle went again. He gets an extra point for doing so, has increased his lead. The other three are almost equal. Jenny Eclair and Graham Norton in second place, only one point ahead of Clement Freud. And Paul, will you take the next round? The subject is Chinese medicine or medicine, whichever your pronunciation you prefer, mm. starting now. I do know a great deal about Chinese medicine. I know that acupuncture is about 6,000 years old, and they have all kinds of different systems of explaining how the human body can repair and heal itself when it's a... <laughs> as they say Graham in Peking. 
fancy reading a prescription. I, didn't, uh, I, I felt hesitation. Well, we call that hesitation, yes. yes, Graham. So tell us something about Chinese medicine. 49 seconds available, starting now. Most things in Chinese medicine are made out of things you would only eat if you were going to die anyway. <laughs> they really don't look that appetizing when you see them hung up in the pharmacy. I say that word because I can once, but I can't repeat it, obviously. Those are the rules of this game. Just a minute. Hi, thanks for coming. <laughs> Chinese medicine is a wonderful form of cures. Doctors in China use it because they want you to get better so that you can pay them. They don't have National Health Service. Um, Jenny Challenge. Yeah, what is it? What, what, what? <laughs> you and them, you and them, you and them. You and them, yes. You and them. Oh, Jenny. Have you I, drifted I, into some sort of netherworld? What are you saying? I thought you were looking at me beseechingly. No, I wasn't. No, I was you wasn't. Very no. confident. This I is something I know what lots about. <laughs> They're sitting beside each other, but I think Jenny was trying too hard. And uh, an incorrect challenge, and uh, or benefit of the doubt to Graham. 16, uh, no, how many seconds available? 17 seconds. Chinese medicine starting now, Graham. 17 seconds, you say? I am glad. Because my wealth of knowledge about Chinese medicine is hard to curtail. Let me enlighten you at some length. I hope you're sitting comfortably because I have so much... <laughs> so Graham Norton got that extra point and he's moved forward. He's still in second place, a few points behind Paul Merton, head of Jenny Claire and Clement Freud. Clement, will you take the next round? The subject, burgers. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. Burgers are people who live in a borough, <laughs> such as cheeseburgers, who presumably reside in a place of the... Yes. I failed. <laughs> yes, you're running a bit out of steam, Clement, but, uh, um, Jenny, you got him first. Hesitation. Hesitation. 49 seconds. Tell us something about burgers, Jenny, starting now. Burgers get a terribly bad press, but if you make your own out of organic ground beef from your good butchers, maybe the one in Lordship Lane, East Dulwich, near where I live, mmm, free chop for me, I think, <laughs> you can make tasty burgers that don't need to be a... Uh, Graham Challenge. Repetition of make. Yes, yes right. you can make, you had to make. Cooked, cooked. Yes. Mm, yes. Right. So, Graham, you tell us something about burgers. There are 32 seconds available, starting now. In the moving film, Dancer in the Dark, Bjork, the loon from Iceland, <laughs> is sentenced to death. Oh, dear, I hope you've seen it. Otherwise, I'd rather spoil the story for you. And she's sitting on death row, and they bring her last meal. A poor challenge. A repetition of death. Yes. Oh. Sense of death. Death Row is a, a one word. <laughs> no, no. No, you think of you're worth a try. You're thinking of Jeff Row. <laughs> <laughs> Very similar. Right, Paul, 15 seconds, tell us something about burgers, starting now. They are perhaps the greasiest food you can eat these days. If you look in one of these kitchens of one of those multinational... Oh, right, one, Clement, one. challenge. Repetition of one of those. One of those, yes, Clement, well listened. Nine seconds, tell us something more about burgers, starting now. Some people believe that burgers are greasy, but they're not. Only if there's much fat in them. And the best sort of burgers are those made with hardly... Clement Freud got that extra point then when the whistle went. He's still in third place, but he's now equal with Jenny Clare. He's moving forward. Graham Norton's ahead, and then Paul Merton in the lead. And Graham Norton, we'd like you to take the next round. And the subject is how to be environmentally friendly. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. The best way to be environmentally friendly is not to throw anything away. But what I found is, that turns your own personal environment into a sort of living hell. <laughs> Soon you're lying on a big case of bottles. Well, for tax, blah, blah. Small child. Hesitation. Hesitation. Da, 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 da. All right, you don't need to repeat it. <laughs> you all heard it the first time. Well, sorry, Greg. <laughs> oh, his face is a picture. Four, four seconds, Paul. How to be environmentally friendly, starting now. It's very difficult, because if you drive to the bottle bank to get rid of your unwanted glassware, how much energy have you consumed in garbon emissions? Garbon emissions? <laughs> garbon emissions? It's like an echo. Yeah, yes, I know. <laughs> oh, we're all getting so tense and excited. Right. <laughs> 
I wish you'd, I wish you'd share it with the rest of us. <laughs> well, maybe if I touch Janet's hand at that particular moment, I don't know. I have to take her hand every so often because she's got the stopwatch there and I have to Why, is she hand. a stranger in paradise? <laughs> She's a silent stranger if she is. Right, 37 seconds, how to be environmentally friendly, Jenny, starting now. Buy a bike, get knocked off it and insist on being buried in a cardboard coffin. There, you've done your bit. The other thing you can do is go and live in a teepee in Wales. Of course, that takes the friendliness out of it. No one's going to visit you, are they? Can't you see their point, you stinky hobbit living in a tent? <laughs> Stinky Hobbit, yes. Repetition of tents. Yes, you had another tent earlier on. I and... thought I'd won. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jenny, I love it, because you're not always with it. It's, uh, it's, uh, 18 seconds, Paul. How to be environmentally friendly, starting now. It's very difficult to lead a green life. Uh, Graham Challenge. Repetition of difficult. Yes, he did say it was difficult before. He said yes, it again. He did. 16 seconds available. How to be environmentally friendly, Graham, starting now. I recycle things, but I can't say that word because I did before. Uh, <laughs> challenge. Repetition. Yes, he recycle. said. Recycle. Recycle. No, I never said recycle. No, you, I didn't. You said you did. No, I, just now, I did. <laughs> Fiendishly clever. Give yeah. him a point. Give him a point. Yeah. No, no, he gets a point for incorrect yeah. challenge. Twelve seconds. <laughs> How to be environmentally friendly starting now. Rhino dung can be made into paper. It's not a very pleasant letter to get, but still, you know you've done your bit. Ooh, the post's here. <laughs> Poor challenge. No, I think the rhino's done his bit. <laughs> So you have a challenge with the rules. No, you don't. But you get a bonus point for your comment, which was very amusing. And <laughs> the audience loved it. And there are two seconds for you, Graham, with another point, of course. How to be environmentally friendly starting now. A large compost heap is the best thing to have at the bottom of your garden. Well, let me give you the situation points-wise as we now move into the final round in this show. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I'm glad you feel like that. Um, hey, have you seen outside? I know. <laughs> you mean they've only come in here to rest their feet? <laughs> it's a mugger's gauntlet when we leave here. <laughs> right. So, uh, Graham, uh, I give you this score as we move into the final round. Uh, Clement Freud, for once, is training a little in fourth place. He's one point behind Jenny Clare, who's in a strong third place. But um, she's behind Graham Norton, who's three points behind our leader. But the moment is Paul Merton. And Jenny, we'd like you to start this round. Poetry in motion. 60 seconds are starting now. Pamers on a uh, oh, <laughs> Pamers on a unicycle. Well, no, you've been challenged. Ah. You had challenges from Graham and Paul. Both their lights came on together. Well, it was hesitation on my side. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was hesitation over here as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Even, yeah. even sitting close. Yes. Yeah. I think that was a good attempt, but both, both of you were completely erroneous. You only been going for half a second, so no points. Jenny, you have a point for that. You still have 59. Could I have an extra point for not challenging? Yes. <laughs> Audience applause endorses that, that you, you should have an extra point, Clement. So you have an extra point for not challenging. And we're getting so many new rules in just a minute. <laughs> How many new ideas can they think up to gain their points? Uh, 59 and a half seconds, Jenny, with you. Well, with you, it's still there. Poetry in motion starting now. Verse doesn't have to be involved. It's a sort of figure of speech. Let's say you're watching a young lad doing his skateboard business really well. That could be poetry in motion. Or a surfer dude riding the crest of the wave on Bondi Beach. A little ballerina lady with bleeding toes pirouetting round again and doing that spinny thing. Hurrah! for her. She is poetry in motion. I used to be a poet and I used to move... Oh! oh. Graham, you challenge. Yeah, a representative used to be. Yes, oh, used to be, I yes. I used to be many things. Mm. <laughs> and uh, you have 25 seconds, Graham. Tell us something about poetry in motion starting now. There is a poet called Anne 
Andrew motion, which makes me think of this subject, poetry in motion, and yet it sounds a bit toilet-based, doesn't it? <laughs> As if he's eaten books of his own verse. I'm not enjoying the visual image. I'm sure he's very good. He's no laureate or anything. Do we still have one uh, of those? Clement Salas. He is the poet. He is the poet. <laughs> <laughs> were the chances of that. <laughs> and he also happens to, he also happens to listen to this show. <laughs> yes, he Andrew Motion is our present poet laureate. Hey, get a PR, Andy. All right. And Clement, you've gone in with the correct challenge with six seconds ago. Poetry in motion starting now. If you have been constipated for a long time <laughs> and take laxatives, then that could be called poetry in motion. So Clement's particular unsavory thought brought that show to a close. He gained an extra point for speaking as the whistle went. I give you the final score. Clement was worried about trailing a little. He still trailed a little, but he didn't trail into fourth place. He's just ahead of Jenny Clare, who are a few points behind Graham Norton, uh, who came in a brilliant second place. Absolutely amazing. Didn't quite make it to the front. But two points ahead was Paul Merton. So, Paul, we say this week, you are our winner. Thank you. Thank you. We do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute. It only remains for me to say thank you to these four excellent players of the game. Paul Merton, Graham Norton, Jenny Eclair, and Clement Freud. I also thank Janet Staplehurst, who's helped me with the score. She's blown that whistle with great style when the 60 seconds elapsed. We thank our producer-director, Claire Jones. We are indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this game, and we do thank this lovely audience here at the Harlequin Theatre in Red Hill, who've cheered us on our way. We've enjoyed it. You've enjoyed it. From them, from me, Nicholas Parsons, and the team, goodbye. Tune in the next time you play Just a Minute. Welcome to Just a Minute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it's my pleasure to welcome our many listeners in this country and, of course, around the world, but also to welcome to the program four exciting and talented personalities who are going to speak with humour and eloquence and style and wit on a subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition or deviation. And those four intrepid players of this game are seated on my right, Paul Merton and Clement Freud, and seated on my left, Tony Hawkes and Giles Brandreth. Will you please welcome all four of them? As usual, I'm going to ask them to speak on a subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating. And I, beside me sits Janet Staplehurst. She's going to help me with a score. She'll blow a whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Northcote Theatre in the delightful city of Exeter. And we have... <laughs> And we have a delightful Devonian audience here. <laughs> Some of them will come from way outside the boundaries of this county, but they're all eager to get the show going, so we'll begin with Paul Merton. Oh, Paul, a nice topical subject. Grockles. <laughs> You'll have to explain why it's topical, but talk on the subject, 60 seconds, starting now. Well, as I understand it, it's a term for tourists, basically everybody that's not in this theatre is a grockle, as it uh, goes. It seems to me, is it a term of abuse, or is it perhaps something meant kinder? I don't know. <laughs> Giles, you challenged. Hesitation. Mm. There was a hesitation, yes, he wasn't sure. Yeah. So, Giles, you have a correct challenge, you get a point for that, of course, and there are 48 seconds available. Tell us something about grockles in this game starting now. Do you recall the lawyer who couldn't tell the difference between arson and incest and set fire to his sister? Well, I have a cousin <laughs> who couldn't tell the difference between a grockelspiel... Uh, Tony, you've challenged. Uh, repetition of difference. Mm. Oh! 
Ooh. Yes. <laughs> Raise a sharp. Tony, a correct challenge. 41 seconds available. Grockles starting now. We, the performers, are Grockles here this evening, not born and raised in Exeter, as we perhaps should have been such a fine place it is too, or we good to grog... Uh, Paul Challenge. I'm sorry, it would have been awfully inconvenient for me to be born in Exeter, because <laughs> my mother's never been to Exeter. <laughs> She's never been here. She'd like to come, but she's never been. So what is your challenge with well, the deviation. Movie? It would not be easier for me to have been born in Exeter, is what Tony was saying. <laughs> or do you think it would have been? Well, it would have been if your mother was here. Yeah, but she wasn't. That's my point, you see. <laughs> I think it's a very semantic point. I don't know whether how to judge on that. I think I have to give the benefit of the doubt to Tony, because mm. he was only making a supposition mm. on the basis that none of us come from this part of the world, so it would have been more difficult for us to have come here. So you have the benefit, Tony. You keep Thank the subject. You very much. A point thrilled. for that. And 31 seconds, Grockles starting now. I'm I'm not a grockle myself, so I cannot judge the feelings you must feel when someone comes in, like me, and starts wandering around Newton Abbott and saying, this is ghastly. But that is not... <laughs> Touched a bit of a nerve, I see. A little bit of research. Always oh, chat. Uh, Clemens challenge. Repetition a bit. Yes, there was too much of a bit before. <laughs> oh, they're sharp in the audience, too. <laughs> Mind of them that it was a repetition, and Clement, we're going to hear from everybody in the first round of this subject of Grockles. Ten seconds available, Clement, starting now. In Widdicombe Fair, Peter Brewer, Jan Stewart, <laughs> Uncle Tom Cobbley, they were all Grockles. The one thing they had in common was the Grockolinity. <laughs> Whoever is speaking when the whistle goes in this game gains an extra point. It was Clement Freud. He has two, so is Tony Hawkes. Charles has got one. Paul Merton's yet to score. But, Tony, you take the next round. The best way to spend St. Valentine's Day. Oh, that no. <laughs> Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. The best way to spend Valentine's Day is to book a romantic restaurant, candle-lit, perhaps with a violinist playing, but not do what I did last year and do it when you're single. It's fantastically embarrassing to sit there and view all the other couples kissing and cuddling whilst you read the evening stand. A jar's challenged. Deviation. There couldn't be other couples, given that he's there on his own. <laughs> That's uh, very shrewd and, uh, you yeah. know, and uh, grammatically, technically correct. John, I mean, so. I mean, in an English class, that's a fantastic challenge. <laughs> On an entertainment programme, it's a bit disappointing. <laughs> Um, no, no, Giles, you're perfectly correct. Uh, a very interesting and clever challenge. <laughs> so you get the point. You get the subject. You have 40 seconds. The best way to spend St. Valentine's Day starting now. On the 14th of February, 1984, in a television studio rung by a breakfast station called TVAM, I attempted the longest ever screen kiss with the lovely Anne Diamond. This osculatory marathon was brought to me, I noticed, by a wonderful film starring Regis Toomey and Jane Wyman, in which they puckered up... Tony, you challenge. I want to hear about Valentine's Day. <laughs> I think he was associating kissing, uh, which is love and affection. He hadn't even and... mentioned Valentine's Day. Yes, he did. He yeah. said that was right the beginning on oh, Valentine's I, I, Day. I made a he mistake. He was snogging, I... uh, what's her name? I apologise. And, uh, <laughs> and so, Giles, an incorrect challenge, a point to you, 23 seconds, the best way to spend St. Valentine's Day starting now. This was a memorable St. Valentine's Day because just as we were achieving our moment of apotheosis, we were interrupted by live coverage of of President Brezhnev's funeral, which unfortunately was taking place in Moscow at the time. Clement Chalice. You can't have live coverage of a funeral. <laughs> we have, the, the, the coverage... <laughs> The coverage was live, and indeed we went on to discuss the whole question of the kiss of life and whether it was appropriate under the circumstances. I think you're trying to justify yourself. As the way you got him on other couples, I think Clement's entitled to have that one on the uh, line. Uh, are we to assume that the TV director made the decision that you kissing Anne Diamond wasn't as exciting as Leonard Brezhnev's funeral? <laughs> <laughs> and so cut to Moscow as soon as they could? <laughs> well, I could imagine that could happen, but anyway, so... Um... <laughs> Uh, uh, Clement, you have a correct challenge. You have 12 seconds. The best way to spend St. Valentine's Day starting now. Make up a poem. Susie hates me. A poor challenge. Was there a hesitation there? There was a hesitation. Well. Yes. Mm. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, is that the local dialect? What's that? <laughs> What's going on over here? It's not pantomime, you know. <laughs> I think they were endorsing your challenge. Were they? Yes. So you had ten like seconds Rosie. on the best way to spend St. Valentine's Day starting now. Stand in the... Uh, ten <laughs> seconds. Hesitation. <laughs> I will give you a bonus point for cheek and for the fact the audience applauded you, but it was utterly incorrect. So Paul has another point as well for an interruption and nine seconds on the best way to spend St. Valentine's Day, Paul, starting now. Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon in Some Like It Hot begin that movie as jazz musicians, but when they witness a murder committed on St. Valentine's Day... <laughs> At the end of that round, Paul Merton was speaking as a whistle went. He's now equal in second place with Giles Brandreth. They're one point behind our leader, Clement Freud, and Tony is just behind them. And Giles, we'd like you to take the next round. I don't know why we'd like you to take it, because the subject is plastic surgery. And um, <laughs> from my knowledge, you haven't had any, but you can talk on it starting now. This morning I got up and wandered into the bathroom, potted up to the mirror, looked into it and thought, yes, rather tasty, attractive in its own way. <laughs> then unfortunately I popped in my contact lenses and suddenly a late middle-aged man appeared. And I thought, ah, my wife is right after all. And if she concedes that she will start shaving her legs, I will indeed begin on the operations that are required. Plastic surgery is necessary. I am going to commence with the neck. At the moment I'm just using cellotape to keep the skin... <laughs> pulled back and then when I've triumphed there I'm going to move lower down because unfortunately my uh, Paul challenge move slower down slower down oh yes because the way my body hangs down in pleats it's a matter of flooring and flooring <laughs> You enjoyed your attempt to justify it, Giles, but it was uh, uh, incorrect. Uh, it was deviation from English as we understand it. I think that's the only thing to say. 25 seconds, Paul. Plastic surgery starting now. You wouldn't believe it, but there's two members of this panel here tonight who have had plastic surgery. I wonder if you can guess who they are. Uh, Tony Challenge. He seems to have left a big gap for them to guess. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping you might jot it down. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we call that possibly hesitation. Oh, yeah. It was hesitation because nobody's going to guess and because I don't think anybody... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not me, I can tell you. <laughs> You're all looking at me because I'm the oldest. Uh, 16 seconds, plastic surgery with you, Tony, starting now. It's difficult to believe, but I used to be incredibly ugly. But I went... <laughs> Charles challenged. It's impossible to believe. <laughs> it is. So that's yeah. deviation. Yes, I don't think. You're a very handsome fellow. I don't think you were ever incredibly ugly. But I was going to tell the story of this brilliant plastic surgeon. No, I know you were, but you said you were once incredibly young, ugly, and I don't believe that. So, well, Charles, I consider that to be a correct challenge. <laughs> That's the most magnificently charming way to turn down my uh, appeal. It I is, it is. But it's You're true. being so nice. I, I, have, I, to have, to be, I have to be accurate. With I have to accept your minute. unreasonableness because it's so nice. <laughs> It's a pity, because I know you are being modest. Um, 11 seconds with you, Giles, on plastic surgery starting now. Jordan is a personal friend of mine. I'm not speaking of the river or the country, but of Katie Price, a gorgeous creature who has had a nip here and the odd little bit of suction there. She's had them enlarged. <laughs> Giles Brandry is speaking as a whistle when gain that extra point. He's moved forward. He's one ahead of Clement Freud and Paul Merton equal, and then it's Tony Hawks. It's all very close. And Clement, we'd like you to take the next round. The subject is having a knees up. Tell us something about that subject in this game starting now. The words of the song, I seem to recall, are knees up, Mother Brown, knees up, MB, knees up, knees up, don't get the breeze up, knees up and the same woman who came earlier <laughs> in the vest. I would oh, Paul, like to make... Sorry, Paul has challenged. I never heard the buzzer go, but your lights come up. On. What's that? I didn't... No, I didn't challenge. You didn't press it. Your I'd like a point. Up. I'd like... <laughs> <laughs> well, you weren't interrupted, even if it was by me, and the audience clapped, so we give you the bonus point, Clement. And... <laughs> He loves his bonus points. 45 seconds still, having a knees up, starting now. I would like to make an official statement... On the fifth... A jazz challenge. 
I think there was a pause before the official statement. He made his announcement of the official statement and then but I waited. Thought that was, I thought that was a dramatic pause in there. It was a dramatic pause. Because I wanted to hear what the statement was going to be. But if in just a minute we wait for dramatic pauses, we'd never get on with the show. No, that's true. That's true. And also, uh, it would inhibit I, I might as well go. <laughs> You Listen. can keep going with style and aplomb, Clement. You don't have to have so, the benefit of the doubt on those sort of things. Forty seconds with you, uh, Giles, uh, having a knees up starting now. When I was a member of Parliament, I was invited to an old people's home for a knees up. This was something of a misnomer, because all I could see was the clatter of Zimmer frames as I came in, <laughs> and every single one of the knees was firmly placed where they should be, not actually up, but down. Yeah, Clement challenge. Deviation. Why? You can't see the clatter of Zimmer frames. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Clement, I don't think you're right. You do hear the clatter, but yeah. you can observe it. This, no, you can't I'm see afraid the these clatter. people were severely hard of hearing. I felt it would be discourteous to suggest someone could hear it. <laughs> I think, actually, Giles, to be fair to Clement, I gave it to you on Other Couples earlier on, which was a, a grammatical inaccuracy of which uh, Tony indulged in. So, Clement, we give you the benefit of the doubt there and say, yes, having an ease up with you now, 27 seconds, starting now. I shall no longer make a personal statement. <laughs> Tony Giles. <laughs> yes. Can you be challenged for being in a bit of a sulk? <laughs> I think he was going for another laugh. Yeah. Didn't I come think a hesitation, actually. though. I, 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 I want to hear what his personal statement is. <laughs> One minute we're going to hear it, then we're not going to hear it. it it's driving me mad. Well, we're here to the end of the round. So, okay. 23 seconds with you, Tony, having a knees up, starting now. After these recordings, we don't go straight home to bed. We panellists, we have a knees up back at the hotel. What an evening it is. We don't let each other repeat, deviate, or do anything like that. We've got buzzers fitted up at the table by the placemats. It's so exciting. We Bicker till four. Uh, Paul Challenge. What is he talking about? <laughs> He's living in some fantasy showbiz land there. <laughs> you yeah, we, we, we... Oh, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> I've yeah. just been told to get on the minibus straight back to London. <laughs> Now, let's be fair, we, we do have a little hospitality out of us, but it's not a knees up. So, Paul, I agree with your challenge. And you have uh, six, eight seconds on having a knees up starting now. One way of testing how well your body's working is to go to the doctor and ask him to apply a simple measure of medicine to the part of your... Mm. Paul Merton speaking as a whistle when gained that extra point, and he's now uh, uh, equal with Giles Brandreth, one point behind Clement Freud and one point ahead of Tony Hawkes. Clement, do you wish us to have the knowledge of your statement or not? No way. <laughs> so that's going to be a secret that you're keeping. And, uh, no. But let's carry on with the show. Paul Merton, your turn. Uh, the subject is Over the Moon. We go from having a knees up to over the moon. Tell us something about the subject in this game, starting now. It was a phrase that was very popular with professional footballers in the 1970s. When all they asked after a game, how do you feel? They'd say, over the moon or sick as a parrot, Brian. It seemed to be those were the two common things that these professional athletes were able to utter. I think that over the moon is a marvellous expression because it just pictures how high and happy your emotions are. As you soar in the sky, borne aloft on an emotion of love. As I look at Clement... Well, you no, know, Tony Challenge. Is there a repetition of emotion? No, emotions and emotion. Ah, right. There's that noise again. <laughs> He's played the game a lot, so I have to listen for these things. It's a Devonian moon. Is it? You only hear it in excellent places like that. It's, it's very, very reassuring. But uh, uh, an incorrect challenge, Paul. 36 seconds. Over the moon, starting now. Georges Méliès was a French cinematographer in the early stages of the 19th century. Well, that's not true. It was the 20th century. Uh, a <laughs> challenge. Deviation. Wait, both deviations. There were no cinematographers in the early part of the 19th no. century. No, that's true. So 30 seconds, Clement. Over the moon, starting now. I was over the moon. Uh, the Paul challenge. Well, I mean, there was enough gap there for a personal statement. I mean, it was just... <laughs> Gentlemen, I'm afraid there was... I think you'd better get this statement You're ready, right because then you can use it. <laughs> I'm dying to know what it is. What is that? Well, and you, he, you'll have to tempt him. You're sitting close to him. Okay. 28 seconds. I don't mean tempt him in that way. I mean just... <laughs> 
tease it out of him, is okay, all I, I should will, say. I will, I uh, will. Over the moon, uh, Paul, 28 seconds, starting now. What's your personal statement, Clement? Uh, <laughs> Clement Challenge. Deviation. Deviation. <laughs> so, uh, deviation on what grounds? Nothing to do with over the moon. I know, but he only said three words. They were devious words. <laughs> He might have been going on to justify there's something to do with over the moon. I think he's allowed to get started. I really do. Three seconds, uh, um, three words is really not fair. 27 seconds, Paul, over the moon, starting now. It was one of the first films that used stop-motion photography and the aforementioned man I mentioned earlier... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, aforementioned... No. mentioned. Aforementioned, mentioned? Aforementioned man I mentioned earlier. Isn't it's aforementioned one word and mentioned no, another? No, 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 aforementioned. Giles, you have over the moon, you have 21 seconds starting now. Hey, diddle, riddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon, the little dog laughed to see such fun. Uh, Tony challenged. Well, it's actually not hey, diddle, riddle, it's hey, diddle, diddle. <laughs> the whole point of this is we're leading up to the fact that this is a very dysfunctional family. <laughs> uh, Bedwetting was an essential part of the problem. Hey, diddle, riddle. I was coming to that. All right, Tony, benefit of the doubt, deviation from the words that was doing, understand them and know them. 16 seconds, over the moon, uh, Tony, starting now. I was over the moon to be invited on this show down to Exeter because I love to grovel to the people down in this area. Uh, Paul Challenge. Uh, two downs. Two downs, you were coming down too often. Yes. Now. And uh, there are nine seconds, Paul, over the moon, starting now. There's a very funny joke which concerns Neil Armstrong. He was on the moon relating these messages back to the Space Exploration Centre in Houston. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, Paul Merton speaking as a whistle when gained the next point. He's now taking the lead ahead of the other three who are almost equal in second place. Tony, take the next round, please. Oh, a lovely Devonian subject. Clotted cream. Ooh. <laughs> They're showing their girth in the audience, all right. Uh, talk on the subject, if you can, Tony. 60 seconds, starting now. If I was offered the choice of a knees-up with Angelina Jolly or Kira Knightley, or a lovely clotted cream tea down here, perhaps in Newton Abbott, of course, <laughs> I would pick the former. I'm not an idiot. But I would enjoy the clotted cream tea because it is delicious. The scones are a lovely mixture of biscuit and cake on a plate. <laughs> Never toasted. That would be foolish. Uh, the cream is... Uh, Jar's challenge. I think er uh, is a kind of hesitation. It is a hesitation, yes. Mm -hmm. It's a bit sharp, but it was true. He did say er. Uh. So, right, Giles, you have clotted cream. You have 35 seconds starting now. In my fantasy life, I am a pupil at Greyfriars School, created by the great Frank Richards, where William George Bunter loves clotted cream teas. Yaroo! Oh, crikey, he says, as the hamper arrives, oozing with jam and butter and clotted creams. Mr. Quelch comes in and tries to take these succulent, moist products from the boy. There is a kind of violent altercation when the master, swishing his cane, descends upon the child and grabs from his lips the very crumbs, covered as they are, with gooseberry, raspberry, strawberry, and every other kind of unctuous ointment all the thrill. An extra loud round of applause because Giles was going with such animation and histrionics that it was absolutely over. Well, we were frightened, actually, were we? <laughs> the St. John's ambulance people are standing by. <laughs> absolutely. When you were speaking, when the whistle went, gained the extra point. And what is the situation at the end of the round? I'll let those know because some people love to hear about the score and the points. Uh, Giles has moved forward. He's now in second place uh, behind Paul Merton, one ahead of Clement Freud and three ahead of Tony Hawks. And Giles, it's also your turn to begin. Tommy Cooper... Tell us something about Tommy Cooper in this game, starting now. Tommy Cooper once said to me, don't worry if your job is small and your rewards are few. Remember that the mighty oak was once a nut like you. This was not the Tommy Cooper of television fame, but a boy in my class also called Tommy Cooper, who had an obsession with his namesake. Indeed, the child I knew went around wearing a fez instead of his school cap. And when the Latin master, Mr. Stock, said to him, repeat, a mo, a mas, a mat, a marmus, a martis, a mant, the boy said, uh, just like that, Oh. Yes. There was a hesitation there. No, was a... that was part of the impression. I know not a very good impression. You did say, uh... uh, uh did just, like uh just like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like that. Uh, just like that. Just like that. I think they're struggling out a bit now. I must say, you do go at paces, so your ers are shorter than other people's ers. 
but I think Paul mm. got in just on the air. Uh, so, Paul, 33 seconds. Tommy Cooper starting now. I remember seeing Tommy Cooper's last live performance. Uh, Clement Challenge. That was a history. Yes, it was, mm. Clement. So you tell us something about Tommy Cooper, 30 seconds starting now. Tommy Cooper was a tremendous Exeter City fan when he was in the third division south. St. James's Park was a place Tommy Cooper never failed to visit. He had clotted cream teas, and there was no question at that time of the club being in the conference of Uri Geller or Michael Jackson. Giles, you challenge. I felt there was a yes, kind of hesitation. Was. I was sharp with you on the other one on the hesitation. Gave it against you. I give it to you this time. 13 seconds, Tommy Cooper. Back with you, Giles, starting now. Tommy Cooper came from this part of the world, which explains why he was such a remarkable person. Though originally born in Wales, his parents migrated to the Grockle country, where the great man, such an artist... A Clement challenge. Two greats. You had ah, a great man before. I did. You did indeed. I did. So, so great was his Well, presence. listen, Clement, you've got him with two seconds to go. Oh. Ooh, on Tommy Cooper starting now. He was very fond of fish and chips. So Clement was speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point. He's moved forward. Uh, I've heard we've only time for one more round. So, oh. but as we go into the final round... I'm sure you'd like to know what the situation is, because it's very even. Paul Merton's just in the lead, one ahead of Clement Freud, and he's one ahead of Giles Brandreth, who's two or three ahead of Tony Hawks. So that is a sequence as we begin the last round with Clement Freud, and it is How to Eat an Oyster. 60 seconds as usual, Clement, starting now. The answer is simply with enjoyment. Don't listen to people who say you should swallow it, because that is total nonsense. It's like in one gulp taking a sausage, saying there's no other way to eat it. Oysters are absolutely delicious if you are of the... Uh, Tony Challenge. I don't know, actually. I, I think I withdraw. I thought he was hesitating, but I don't think he did. Actually. Well, he was teaching he? on a hesitation. Do you think so? But uh, I've given the benefit of the doubt against him on a number of occasions. He has the benefit of the doubt on this occasion. 42 seconds. Carry on, Clement. How to eat an oyster starting now. Given the benefit of the doubt, you should eat two oysters, maybe three or four. <laughs> As I said, they are, I think, wonderful seafood, which you should never reject if given to you. Don't believe for one second... They have any... Uh, Tony Challenge. He said believe in the first uh, Yes, you were about believing, yes, about... How believing, yes. Yes. So... Not believe. Uh, hmm? <laughs> <laughs> no, I what think you did say you're muttering then again. No, I, I was correcting you, but it seems pointless. <laughs> Clement, it's never pointless. I hate anybody to feel they okay, have... Okay, give me a point. <laughs> I give you the benefit of the doubt. I've given it to Clement. I give it to you now. How to eat an oyster, Tony, starting now. I used to go to How to Eat an Oyster. <laughs> hesitation and deviation of the English language. Oh. And which which one do you want? Vowels. I'd like all three in different ways, but certainly <laughs> hesitation. He stumbled over it, and that forced a hesitation upon him. There was deviation of the English language in the way that flowering. I can't is give not you three happens. points, John. No, I just I give like you one, one point. No. One point. I'm grateful for that. Twenty-five seconds. How to eat an oyster? Starting now. Than an oyster, there's nothing moister or more confusing because these creatures are neutral in terms of gender. You don't know whether you are consuming a male one or a female one or one. That is and the Clement oh, challenge. One. Two one. One. Three yes. ones. Yes. So you got back in, Clement, but 13 seconds. Right. How to eat an oyster starting now. Ideally on a bed of spinach with a hollandaise sauce made of egg yolk, butter, juice, salt, malted white peppercorns, and a sharp knife. <laughs> Clement was then speaking as the whistle went and gained that extra point. And the final situation is that Tony Hawks came only just in fourth place, but did extraordinarily well. Ah. Oh. No, his contribution was lovely, as always. Housewife's favourite, I think. Yes. <laughs> Giles Brandreth, great contribution, but finishing in third place. One point behind Paul Merton. But Paul was two points behind Clement Freud. So we say, this week, Clement, you are our winner. Thank you very much indeed. But anyway, 
anxious to say thank you to these four delightful players of the game, Paul Merton, Clement Freud, Giles Brandreth and Tony Hawks. I also thank Janet Staplehurst, who's helped me with the score and blown her whistle so delicately after the 60 seconds. Uh, we thank our producer-director, Claire Jones. We're indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this game. And we're grateful to this lovely audience, this Devonian audience here in the Norco Theatre in Exeter, who've cheered us on our way. Thank you from the audience. Thank you from me, Nicholas Parsons, and from our panel. Tune in again the next time we play Just a Minute. Next week, Just a Minute comes from the Shaw Theatre in London, where Nicholas Parsons will be joined by Paul Merton, Lisa Tarbuck, Kit Hesketh-Harvey and Chris Neal. Welcome to Just a Minute. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it's my pleasure to welcome our many listeners throughout the world, and of course to welcome to the programme this evening four delightful and clever exponents of this show. And seated on my right we have that uh, very skilled and talented player of the game, Paul Merton, and seated behind him the very clever, witty lyricist and performer, Kit Hesseth Harvey, and seated on my left, we have the lovely, delightful actress, Lisa Tarbuck, and seated beside her, we have that exuberant comedy performer, Chris Neal. Would you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> As usual, I'm going to ask them to speak on a subject that I will give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. And seated beside me is Janet Staplehurst. She's going to help me with the score. She'll blow a whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Shaw Theatre, which is in the Bloomsbury area of northwest London. <laughs> and we have a real Bloomsbury, or a blooming audience anywhere in front of us, <laughs> who are dying for us to start. So we'll begin the show with Paul Merton. <clears throat> Paul, the subject in front of me is... A rolling stone. Tell us something about a rolling stone in this game, starting now. The pop group, the Rolling Stones, are very odd. They're all about five foot seven. You don't realise how small they are until you see them apart, because when they're photographed together, you don't realise, of course, the scale. They all look the same. They could be six... Um, Kit, you've challenged. It's awful to say realise twice so soon in the... Um, oh, yes, probably. Yes, the two realising, yes. 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 Well, I was shocked when I first saw them. <laughs> 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 they're like sort of little borrowers. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Hobbit people. Yeah, yes, little they, hobbit people. They are, they are, um, they are less, their stature is less than average, isn't it? You used to be one of their groupies, didn't you? That's indeed I was, yes. <laughs> in fact, I'll tell you this, their very first television show was in the programme I did with Arthur Haynes. Yeah. And none of them had watched, it was very interesting. The, um, <laughs> <laughs> they made a fetish of it, actually. Um, uh, anyway, there are, um, Kit, you had a correct challenge, so you get a point for that. You take over the subject. There are 50 seconds available. A rolling stone starting now. A rolling stone can gather no moss, proverbially, although a baby shamble can. And it's astonishing when you think of how paleolithic these old men are. Sir Mick Jagger waggling his bus pass provocatively at us, singing, I can't get no sonatogen. I love Keith Richards in particular, that waggish bit. Uh, Paul Challenge. A deviation. I don't think Mick Jagger's old enough for a bus pass yet. I don't think he's 65. <laughs> no, Is actually, he you're right. He hasn't got his bus pass. Oh, lordy. Uh, <laughs> he'll, he'll get so it that's soon a correct challenge. Well done, Paul. And you have... Uh, the subject back, you have 29 seconds, a rolling stone starting now. When a poll is conducted amongst musicians, they often vote for Bob Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone as being one of the best hit singles ever released. Who can forget those words? How does it feel? A beautiful, I think Perry Como's version perhaps was even better. When you look back at a rolling stone, you think to yourself, there was a magazine, 1968, came out in America, the year just of Mortwood Stock and Altamont, I don't know what I'm talking about now. <laughs> don't know what I'm talking about there. <laughs> I love the blind confidence with which you go on. No, no, I, I feel better for getting it off my chest. <laughs> yes, uh, Kit, you challenged. Yes. I'm sorry, the mod would start. I don't know what that was. It sounded well, like a I, kitchen we, or something. We interpret as hesitation. Yeah, so absolutely. You've got the subject back again, Kit. You have eight seconds available. Tell us something more about the rolling, a rolling stone starting now. Miraculously, Bill Wyman ended up as his own grandfather-in-law when he married the luscious, pouting man. Uh, Chris, new challenge. Was there a little hesitation there? 
I don't think so. No. I think he went with a certain amount of aplomb. Mm. Oh. And, um, okay. I wouldn't interpret it, but lovely to hear from no, him. No, it's nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an interruption. It was, it was an incorrect challenge. So, Kit, you have another point for that. Mm. You keep the subject still. You have two seconds available starting now. Keith Richards has no problems with drugs, <laughs> just with the police. <laughs> Whoever is speaking in this game, when the whistle goes, gains an extra point on this occasion. It was Kit Hesketh Harvey, and you won't be surprised to work out that he is, of course, in a strong lead at the end of the round. Uh, Chris Neal, will you take the next round? The subject is interior decorating. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. Some months ago, I had the words, and diamond was here, tattooed on my stomach lining. And it looks lovely, although you don't often see it, apart from in a good light. Uh, interior, oh no, that's a hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, you've got to stop this habit I of know, when you make a I mistake, know, telling everybody. I know, I just, if, I know. If, you keep go- <laughs> if you keep going, they may not spot it. I know. Well, they might be jealous. <laughs> I know so, uh, Lisa, you challenged first. I did, for the hesitation. For hesitation. Right. I was only, right. actually, mm. after your thumb moved and gave mm. me a clue. Yeah, yeah, mm. no, I bust myself and went, oh, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lisa, good to My hear Lord. from you. You have the subject of interior decorating. There are 48 seconds available, starting now. I've got a man in, at the moment, giving my rear a lick, and when he's finished doing that, he's going to move into the kitchen. <laughs> Chris, challenged. I'm s- It's a painting and decorating term. It's so is not a painting and it's decorating so term. You've got a point for an incorrect challenge. You've got 43 seconds interior decorating starting now. I didn't buy textured paint, of course, so you can see all where I haven't scraped it back. And it looks a little bit tatty, but we will fill it with a very well-known product, which I won't mention. Inside, in the hall, controversially, I've gone for... Uh, Paul Challenge. Is the well-known product Heinz Baked Beans? <laughs> <laughs> Just intrigued what is well. I mean, there have been both people at home taking sort of home handy tips, and if you were saying well known product, it can be anything. It would work though, actually, texturally. It wouldn't last long. No. <laughs> and then, of course, you would want to have a good old lick, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, Lisa gets the point because she was interrupted. She keeps the subject, interior decorating. 31 seconds, starting now. Instead of painting the skirting boards white, I've done it. Um, Chris Challenge. I'm sure you've had painting twice. Yes, you did. You were painting uh, before, clearly. my dear. Clearly. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, Chris, you've got the subject back. You've got 28 seconds, interior decorating, starting now. Recently, I've been reading the blog of model, tireless charity worker and natural-born beauty, Jodie Marsh. And she has been working on having her house in Essex interiorly decorated. And she's avoided having scatter cushions and throws and things and instead have opted for a stripper's pole. It makes a home, I think. And you can... <laughs> Uh, Lisa, do you challenge first? Eight seconds. Uh, What was your challenge? Uh, My challenge was hesitation, actually. I think it was a form of hesitation, Mm -hmm. yes. So you have eight seconds more to tell us something about interior decorating starting now. I've papered outside areas, and in the rooms I've put a lick... Do you know (laughs) I nearly said painting again, didn't I? I think it was painting. There was repetition and hesitation. Mm. Well, you can only have one, but it doesn't matter. Four Four seconds. Interior decorating kit with you starting now. It's when Linda Barker starts talking in that awful voice that I want to open it. <laughs> <laughs> so Kit again was speaking as a whistle when gained that extra point, so he's increased his lead. Lisa Tarbuck is in second place, followed by Paul Merton and Chris Neal. Kit, it's your turn to begin. The subject now is the London Eye. Tell us something about the London Eye, particularly for those visitors to this country. Tell us all about it. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. It sprang up quite suddenly, didn't it? This colossal erection on the South Bank in the Jubilee Gardens at about millennium time. Personally, I loathe it. It's a huge hit with tourists, but you get vertigo (laughs) from staring down at the Houses of Parliament (laughs) 500 feet below you. You can see Windsor Castle and Hackney Marshes, which induces agoraphobia. Claustrophobia from sharing your pod with 18 French students who've done nothing but eat anchovies and garlic for the last week (laughs) sleeping in a bed together. 
and it's staffed by the British Airways people. So you get air stewardesses screaming lacme in a ghastly duet at you. The only time I ever went, thankfully, it was raining so tremendously hard one couldn't see a thing, so I squatted on the floor and played a very... Oh, <laughs> I'm just stopping him in the nick of time. <laughs> So what is your challenge within the rules of just a minute? Uh, was there, uh, was there a repetition of armchair? <laughs> um, no, there were no armchairs there. No, I think he was keeping going amazingly well, no, actually, considering was, the yeah. boring subject. Um, <laughs> And there is, that's another point to you, Kit. Oh, thank Keep you. Keep the subject starting now. And played a sterling round. <laughs> now I've hesitated. And Chris, you challenged. That was hesitation. Chris, you had a correct challenge. You have the London Eye and you have 15 seconds starting now. I went on the London Eye once and the guide, pointing north, rather proudly said, on a clear day, <laughs> you can see St Albans. Lucky us. What a treat that was. I didn't go again. <laughs> it's situated, as Kit said before, on the south bank of London town. <laughs> so, Chris Neal was then speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point. He's now equal in second place with Lisa Tarbuck. They're three points behind Kit Heskill Harvey and one ahead of Paul Merton. And, Paul, will you take the next round? The subject is, why opposites attract? Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. To understand ourselves, we must experience the opposite. Man, woman, talented, Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> There's always a yin and a yang. For whatever we find in the universe, black or white, anti-pasta and the same stuff that I've mentioned before. <laughs> if you bring the two together, there's an almighty explosion. That's what it's all about, opposites. How are we to experience what it is like to be in water unless we've walked around on dry land? How will we know how it feels to uh, be... A uh, kid's challenge. No, Lisa challenge. How are we to... Yes, how are to we? Well, this is the major speech of my life. <laughs> <laughs> 34 seconds, Lisa. Tell us something about why opposites attract, starting With now. Why opposites attract, of course. I'm actually draw... Uh, Paul Challenge. So was that a track? Yeah, it was. It was not a track, it was a track, a so track. deviation. Look, to... respect me, guy. Why Don't ask me. I'll see you in a McDonald yeah. later. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to rub the street off me so I can <laughs> really play the game. Yeah. So what are you challenging them for? Because she didn't say well, she, she said a track, so it's deviation from English. She didn't say attract. <laughs> Not in Streatham, it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a bit. I think it's a bit mean. So okay, hard. But you've got 31 seconds. Why opposites attract? Starting now. Jack Spratt, of course, could eat no fat. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, yes. Was that a hesitation? It was a hesitation, yeah, yeah. yes. So you've got why opposites attract, Chris, and there are 29 seconds starting <laughs> now. Being six foot three, broad-shouldered and blonde, I find myself attracted to small, dark-haired people. Similarly, having 20 ditto vision, I often like people who wear glasses. And uh, on and on it goes. Oh, uh, no. Um, get challenged. There was an error in that one. There yeah, was a definite error yeah. in there, It was all yes. going so well. It was beautiful. Yeah. Yes, and, and the image you were projecting via radio it was yeah. amazing. Well, so You'll be getting the letters, I'm sure, I after this. So. <laughs> yes. 14 seconds available now with you, Kit, on why opposites attract. Starting it's Darwinian, now. isn't it? The theory that you should spread your genes around, which is, incidentally, rather a good way of attracting opposites. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you challenge. Nice yeah, sort of rather. hesitation there. Wasn't a slight there, hesitation, yeah. yes. So the benefit of, of the doubt to you on that one, Paul. Seven seconds, why opposites attract. Starting now. The hippopotamus and the mosquito. Lovers in nature. Who would guess it? <laughs> when you see these two forms ambling towards you, you think... <laughs> so, Paul Merton speaking as the whistle went gained the next point. He's now equal with Lisa Tarbot in second place behind Kit Hesketh Harvey and one ahead of Chris Neal. And Kit, it's your turn to begin. The subject is <clears throat> over the hill. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't look at me like that, please. <laughs> 60 seconds, starting now. Some might think it was a little derogatory or pejorative to give this subject to me, but I prefer to accentuate the positive. I feel like Julie Andrews as I crest the Alp and come down the other side, <laughs> swinging around in my dirndl and running my fingers through my vaguely lesbian haircut as I think <laughs> all the trials of life are behind me. I am now like... Uh, Chris Challenge. <laughs> Deviation. Most lesbians aren't bald, are they? <laughs> <laughs> 
Julie Andrews. You may have an issue with lesbians, but that's very unfair. <laughs> yes. Julie Andrews looked a tiny bit dikey oh, when no, she, she played this dikey. Yeah, yeah, no. It's got nothing to do with it, and you don't look anything like a lesbian, I must say, <laughs> with your challenge. And I agree, I agree entirely with your yes, challenge. Yes, thank you. you. We're going no further, except with you, Chris, on 41, with 41 seconds available, over the hill, starting now. Where I live in Camberwell, just over the hill, there's one of London's largest mental hospitals. How handy is that? What a boon! Fantastic. On the other side, there's not really a hill until, well, you cross the river, and then there's one sort of at Hampstead, and that leads up to Highgate, and then you go beyond that, and then I suppose there's past... No, where's that place? Kid, <laughs> <laughs> you challenge again. Was that a hesitation? It wasn't really. It was, it was kind of like a sort of, he, 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 he it was a rather little... fascinating gazetteer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, 24 seconds, over the hill, starting now. Nicholas Parsons has paid off his mortgage, educated his children admirably. He sits there in the sere and yellow leaf of senescence, gently imbecilic, with a smile on his face as he dribbles into his rug. Chris, you challenge. Deviation, you're not over the hill. Thank oh, you, Oh, no, Chris. hang on a second. Uh, hang, on. <laughs> hang on a second. <laughs> but actually, I'm not dribbling, so that's most important. It is what he says. What's that? Uh... Chris, you have a correct challenge. Over the hill, and there are 13 seconds starting now. I think increasingly society looks at people younger and that same word again as being over the hill when they aren't that old. <laughs> no, Lisa again. There's a light stagger there as he found A stagger the which I would interpret as hesitation, mm. Lisa. So you tell us something rubbish. about over the hill with five seconds to go starting now. I'm not quite over the hill, but if I keep... Uh, Chris oh, hello. Well... Um, <laughs> sorry, no, it's just, sorry, just really awful. Can I have his bonus point? Bonus my bonus point. point. My <laughs> I can't end my words. Today. Well, you get a point anyway for being interrupted. And so you were over the hill, um, three seconds to go. Uh, Lisa starting now. If I keep the momentum up of this week, by June I will be. <laughs> <laughs> So they're all moving. Lisa Tarbuck, who uh, hasn't been with us for a while, but she's doing extraordinary well. She's only... Surge. She's on a real surge, oh, yeah. Oh, how yes, and uh, only two points behind our leader, Kit Hesketh Harvey, and uh, three or four ahead of Paul Merton and Chris Neal. And Paul, your turn to begin. The subject is how to spot a Londoner. 60 seconds, starting now. Well, they're the ones who aren't wearing the tourist guy. I've just been to London and my girlfriend bought me this T-shirt sort of thing. The one time that I found myself actually the focus of attention from one of the gentlemen that runs these tatty little stores when, as a joke, I'd bought a hat that said, I love London, written on it. Kit, you've well, Have we had I love London twice? No. <laughs> 41 seconds, how to spot a Londoner poor starting now. It's that grim determination to get through the day that you spot in the true face of the Londoner. But how do you spot... Spot a true... Uh, Lisa Charles. Two spots. Yes, it's in the subject, though, it's my love. Yeah. Is it? You can repeat any word within a subject like that uh, in this game. Thank you, Uncle so, Nicholas. So, Paul was interrupted. <laughs> and, and who's challenging Kit, yes? Well, there were two trues, actually. It's too late now. Oh, was it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, you carry on with 34 seconds to go on how to spot a Londoner starting now. If you stand at the top... Uh, Chris Challenge. There were two trues earlier yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that is correct, but we're very unfair to give it to you now. Uh, Kit, challenge for it first. No, I'll tell you what I do. I'll give you both a point. Oh, that's very lovely. And then, uh, <clears throat> and leave it with Paul, mm -hmm. which it seems a fair way to do it. So you both got a point. Paul gets a... No, he doesn't get a point. He doesn't get a point for being interrupted. He keeps the subject. 32 seconds. So, Hamlet, am I to understand I'm the only person there that didn't get any points? <laughs> You were interrupted, so you, you should get a point. Yeah, I should, point. really. Yes, yes, that's right. 32 seconds. My God, how they fight for you, <laughs> How to spot a Londoner. 32 seconds, Paul, starting now. Atop the British Telecom Tower with a bottle of ink and just flick the pen as you do and you will spot many a Londoner. But how can we spot a Londoner? We talk about people from Tootin and Hampstead. They're wildly different places and the population are equally distant from each other. Uh, <laughs> challenge. The population is equally distant, isn't it? It's a singular word. The, the population yes, is equally yeah. distant, yes, it's yeah. singular. Yeah. So you're challenging him on grammar, are you? I am. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that's the way Paul always talks. I don't know. I don't, yeah, I, I've got grade four English O level to prove it. <laughs> Actually, I gave the benefit of the doubt to Paul last time, so I'll give it to you on Oh, this that's occasion. very big of you. Thank I think you. that's only fair and generous. So we, Bend we, over backwards we sometimes, don't you? 
14 seconds for you, um, Kit. How to spot a Londoner starting now? Where I live, it's very... Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> Paul. I'd like the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> <laughs> I think that could have been hesitation. Uh, the benefit of that on what basis? Well, I think it was hesitation. It didn't, didn't get going. No, fast no, enough. no. There was no hesitation and no benefit uh, available on that particular challenge. Well, when there is benefits available, can you put a signal like <laughs> <laughs> do a little hand signal so we know when we challenge we there is benefit because some it seems there are benefits available on some challenges, mm. others there are no benefits available. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, an arbitrary, benefits. it's yeah. an arbitrary matter which is interpreted according to the mood and actually the quality of the challenge. OK. Right. The so mood of the challenge? <laughs> well, I should do it by candlelight or something. Hesitation. You still have the subject. <laughs> Repetition. <laughs> <laughs> you still have the subject, Kit. How to spot a Londoner, 13 seconds, starting now. Where I live in Norfolk, they're the ones in the Range Rovers and the Green Wellies, not the souped up. Uh, Paul Town. Well, I'm awfully sorry, but this is clearly deviation, because we're talking about inhabitants of Norfolk, when actually we're talking, the subject is how to spot a Londoner. Hmm. <laughs> I think it was a preamble into London. But, oh, do you really? Again, but, <laughs> but, Paul... How, how interesting but, you should think Paul... <laughs> Oh, oh, she's getting hissy. <laughs> I'm, just, no, I'm no. just playing around with the mood of my challenges. <laughs> the next one will be Peter Laurie. No. <laughs> you despise me, don't you? <laughs> I'm about to illustrate how fair and generous and You're just going I am in all these times. <laughs> You're not going home, are you? You're going home. Oh, gosh. Thank goodness I've got a sense of humour. I can laugh at myself. Right, but Paul, you have the benefit... You're the only one missing the show. You have a definite benefit of the doubt on this one. Oh, thank you. And you have the subject. And you have the point for that. And you have nine seconds on how to spot a Londoner starting now. If we look at the A to Z of London, you can think to yourself, here is a fantastic guide to one of the greatest cities in the world. If you see a Londoner... Uh, Lisa Challenge. Uh, we had two if yous, actually, and I am being pedantic because I've got to be. <laughs> well, you haven't got to be. I, no, I do at this point in the game, I yeah, think. Right. Mm. All right, well, you're quite right. There were two if yous. So, yeah. um. It's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The moon's gone you're... completely, hasn't it? <laughs> so I've and you've that. got in with one second to go. Oh, oh awful. I know. <laughs> you, you've won no friends, but you've got the subject, and you have one. <laughs> So you're lonely, but you've got a point. Yeah. <laughs> How it's does one London place. and Lisa starting now? A dark playing uh, beefy. Chris Lisa. Challenge. Hesitation. No, oh, right. rubbish. I think I should be given the benefit of the doubt, at yeah. least. <laughs> oh, go on, give Chris a point. Lisa gets one for being challenged. You know, sometimes, sometimes in this game, I feel like I'm on a sunshine coach. Hmm. <laughs> to Muswell Hill. <laughs> to Muswell Hill. <laughs> right. Half a second, Lisa, starting now. In <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all very close still. Kit Heskett Harvey is still just in the lead, two ahead of Lisa Tarbuck and Chris Neal and Paul Merton are equal in third place. And Chris, uh, we'd like you to take the next round. It's going to the library. Can you tell us something about going to the library, starting now? I can only assume uh, we've been given this subject, because very next door, very next door... Yeah, yeah. Don't draw attention to it, Chris. You might get away with it. Paul, you challenge. Acute self-awareness. Yes. <laughs> Hesitation, repetition and uh, deviation. Mm. Yes, all three, actually, on that occasion. Mm, yes. um, 55 seconds. Tell us something about going to the library, Paul, starting now. Something I remember very well from my childhood, going to Morden Library. It was a walk up a hill where hippos and mosquitoes kissed on the other side of the fence. <laughs> and what a fantastic library it was, full of books, as you would expect, fiction, non-fiction, hardback, and the softer variety as well. But the record library was the bit that particularly fascinated me because you was able to borrow gramophone LPs, 33 and a third, and and I remember actually getting out The Magic Christian, a film soundtrack which I hadn't seen, the particular movie at that point. But what a fantastic...
fantastic piece of music associated with it. If you know the Paul McCartney song, Here It Is, Come and Get It, sung by Badfinger, it appears in that very thing that I was talking earlier, the entertainment where you go to a cinema and it's flickering away on the screen. Another song that's used in it is Thunderclap Newman's Something in the Air. And I absolutely adored those two pieces of music at the time. So when I eventually saw the motion picture appear on my television screen, I was fascinated to hear the notes coming across through my television, and I've said television four times, and I've been speaking for two minutes, and I don't care! A real, uh, a real tour de force. You get a, a point for uh, speaking when the whistle should have gone, and, uh, <laughs> and another bonus point, because you kept going so magnificently for another 20 seconds after the whistle. <laughs> And I have to tell you that we're moving into the final round. So I'll give you the situation point-wise as we do that, because I know a lot of people put a lot of store by this. I don't think it really matters. Chris Neal. <laughs> it Chris, matters to us. <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, it's a contribution. It's good. I mean, there's Chris in fourth place, but great contribution. And um, <laughs> Paul Merton and Lisa Tarbuck equal in second place. Super contribution. Kit Hesse Harvey, slightly better contribution because he's in the lead. Uh, but, but only, not in quality, but just in points. No, thank you. You're You're absolutely th not in quality. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not start talking about quality on each individual panellist. No, no. <laughs> right, no. Get very depressed. Lisa, yes. would you like to take this round? It's a girl's best friend. 60 seconds, starting now. Traditionally, a girl's best friend might be viewed as a diamond. There's one called the Hope, which was a deep blue thing, but said to be hideously unlucky. And everyone who owned it, from Marie Antoinette and the Sun King, who is Louis XIV, I think, came to hideous ends. Um, uh, kid challenge. I think we're too hideous. It was yeah. too hideous, yes. I'm so sorry. It's a too... word I love as well. You see, it's mm. cursed, the Hope diamond. You shouldn't go there. I shouldn't have yeah. <laughs> No. And, Kate, you've gone in with 44 seconds to go to tell us something about a girl's best friend starting now. Men grow cold as girls grow old, and we all lose our charms in the end. But square cut or pear shape, these rocks don't lose their shape. I think it's a ridiculous... Um, oh. Chris challenged. Is it a repetition of shape? Yeah, no, we should have been shaped. It was my fault for not doing the diction properly. Yeah. That's right, yes. Yeah. So, Chris, you've gone in on a girl's best friend with 35 seconds starting now. I was reading an article in a magazine at the dentist the other day, and it said that a girl's current best friend is a thing called a rabbit. I don't know what that is, but apparently they're very popular on all the rage. Obviously, it's nice to have a hutch in the garden with something <laughs> furry. Oh. Uh, Paul Chalice. Overcome. <laughs> Overcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thought of that smelly hutch in the garden and he overcame and hesitated. <laughs> don't go there, no. <laughs> and you've got 21 seconds, Paul, on a girl's best friend starting now. It's usually a girl's best friend is a mother, I believe, of course. It's up to the individual girl whether that would be her best friend. Some women have very strange relationships with the women that brought them into this world and others get along in a marvellously fantastic way, skipping down the lane. You can't guess that they're actually mother and daughter. They look like twins. How marvellous. And it's marvellous. That's so they use, actually. Uh, Chris Challenge. Is, it, sorry, is that a repetition of marvellous? Yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed, Ooh. yes. So, Chris, yeah. you got in with the marvellous there. With two seconds Ooh. to go, Ooh. a girl's best friend starting now. These days... Who oh, challenged? Oh, hesitation. Portland. Wasn't that I funny? Didn't... Just, just <laughs> at the last second there. You didn't think it'd be possible. It's a little hesitation. No, there was no was hesitation. There not? <laughs> so you've got another point, Chris, and you've got one and a half seconds on a girl's best friend starting now. One of my best friends is a girl. <laughs> Well, what we can say for the final score, it's a very, very even contest. And uh, in third place, equal, were Chris Neal and Lisa Tarbuck, and what a magnificent third place that was. Because was the only one point behind Paul Merton, and what a brilliant second place that was. But then it's two points ahead, so a superb first place, Kit Hesketh Harvey. So we say, Kit, you're the winner this week. Thank you. It only remains for me to say thank you to these four delightful players of the game, Paul Merton, Kit Hesketh harvey Lisa Tarbuck, and Chris Neal. I thank Janet Staplehurst, who has helped me keep the score magnificently and blown her whistle most magnificently. We thank our producer-director, who is Claire Jones. We're indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this game, and we're very grateful to this lovely audience here at the Shaw Theatre in Bloomsbury, who've cheered us on our way. From our audience, from me, Nicholas Parsons, on the panel, goodbye. Welcome to Just a Minute. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
Hill. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it's my pleasure to welcome our many listeners in this country and, of course, around the world, but also to welcome to the program four exciting and talented personalities who are going to speak with humour and eloquence and style and wit on a subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. And those four intrepid players of this game are seated on my right, Paul Merton and Clement Freud, and seated on my left, Tony Hawkes and Giles Brandreth. Will you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> and seated beside me is Janet Staplehurst, who's going to help me keep the score, and she'll blow a whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Northcote Theatre, in that lovely city of Exeter. And we, <laughs> and we have an enthusiastic Devonian audience here who love their city. That's why they cheered and laughed then, but they're longing for us to get on with the show. <laughs> Giles, the subject, New York. What a subject. 60 seconds, starting now. New York isn't Mecca, it just smells like it, said Neil Simon, the distinguished New York playwright. The Bronx, no thonks, quoth Ogden Nash, the celebrated poet who actually hailed from Baltimore. New York, New York, it's my kind of town. Oh, challenge. It's on the card so you can repeat New York. Doesn't mean you've been challenged, right? That's exactly it. I, just, I heard New York, New York, I woke up, I pressed the buzzer. <laughs> I hadn't really been listening, you know. Because of your humorous contribution, you'll get a bonus point for that one. But you get a point, Giles, for being interrupted. New York, and there are still 43 seconds available starting now. To New York, I always say thank you so much, New York, because it was on the steps Herman of Charles. the New York Public Library. That's repetition now. It's I think eight we've, New we've, we've, we've had eight New Yorks. I think that's too many. <laughs> We did once before, and actually Clement was in the no, show, and no. he took me to task on it, because I did actually say, if we have more than five or six New Yorks... You've only had four, because the full address is New York, New York. <laughs> You've actually mentioned New York... You've mentioned New York six or seven times. I won't mention it again, though it is the subject. It's too late. Now. <laughs> Benefit of the doubt to Clement, he has the subject, 39 seconds, New York, starting now. When New York twinned with Totnes, many of us... <laughs> were extraordinarily pleased, proud, and felt encouraged that so small a Devonshire town should have an arrangement of reciproc crosses. <laughs> <laughs> you obviously refer records to stop it than the real word. Right, Giles, you challenge first. Yes, combination of hesitation yeah. leading to deviation. We, we interpret that as hesitation, Good. Giles. Right. 24 seconds, New York, back with you, starting now. It was on the steps of the library in this great city that a beautiful girl who came from Manhattan introduced me to the wonders of the Swiss kiss. The f it's only a challenge. How are you spelling that? <laughs> no, I think that's a uh, deviation. I was going to explain that she had a slight speech impediment. <laughs> she had been brought up in Brooklyn. Right. Be making fun of her then. Yeah. I wasn't. I was kissing her. I was right. saying. Big breath. I think if you're going to do things like that, you should establish before you do that that she had the impediment and then do it. Tony, benefit of the doubt. Thank definitely. you very you have much. The subject, you have 16 seconds, New York, starting now. New York was originally New Amsterdam, and they had shop windows with girls in and coffee shops where you could go in and smoke all sorts of illegal substances, and they thought, well, we better get rid of this. Let's make it New York and put a minster in. And they did that. It was terrific. Terrifically popular. But, you know. So Tony Hawk will then speak as the whistle went, gain that extra point for doing so. And Tony, it's also your turn to begin. We'd like to hear from you on the subject of pegs. Tell us something about pegs in this game, starting now. One of my big banes is the fact that the, it's such a computerised world we live in now. MPEGs are sent to me on my little thing which I have on my desk, electronic big thing, I've already called it, but can't. <laughs> Just tell us. You, Giles, you Repetition challenge. thing. Yes, there are too many things there, right? Uh, 48 seconds, pegs with you, Giles, starting now. Of all the pegs I've known, and that includes Mount Ashcroft, Archer, and various other ladies by the name of Peggy, I suppose my favourite was Peg Balls. She came from a wonderful family of three sisters. Paul challenge. Sorry, isn't that a sexual practice? <laughs> <laughs> isn't it? Oh, the imagery you create, Paul. 
you know all about it, don't you, Nicholas? Have you, yeah, I know all about that, yes. Have you... <laughs> well, at my age, you have to. Right, now, listen, um... <laughs> Have you ever challenged within the rules of just a minute? No, I just heard, I woke up again, heard pegged <laughs> balls. <laughs> but the no, audience enjoyed it so much, I think it was so humorous. You get your bonus point for that. Pegs, 34 seconds starting now. She had sisters, as it happens, called Ophelia and Crystal. But what I remember most about the family was the way that they got together and did the washing of a Monday and took the pegs out of the basket. They were wooden ones and plastic ones. And they got the line and they applied the pegs along the... Yeah, yeah, Tony, you challenged. Uh, well, actually, the audience were quite slow there, weren't they? <laughs> they suddenly went, oh, there was a joke 15 seconds ago. <laughs> um, he did say wooden ones and plastic ones. He Repetition did indeed, one. oh. yes. Wooden mm. ones and plastic ones. Um, so, Tony, a point to you. Pegs, 18 seconds, starting now. It is said that you can't get a round peg in a square hole. But in the... Uh, Clement said what? By whom? <laughs> A lot of sages have said that, and a lot of very ordinary people have said it. No, I don't think you can get a... It, it's, a it's a saying to describe a situation, but it's also actually a correct fact. So why did you want to know who said it? Give him a bonus point. That's what he's working for. <laughs> 13 seconds, Tony, on pegs starting now. My favourite kind of pegs are the ones you get in the board game Kriggage. I love playing this, and I do often... Uh, Giles Challenge. Hesitation. There was a hesitation. He struggled yes. on his pubic. Yeah. Eight seconds, pegs with you, Giles, starting now. When I played the part of Long John Silver, I was offered legs of this kind. And for me to be appearing legless is a bit strange, because I do not drink at all, as you can imagine. <laughs> Speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point. He's one ahead of Tony Hawks and two or three ahead of Paul Merton and Clement Freud on uh, equal on uh, the third position. So on my right, they're training a little. On my left, they're going great guns. Paul, would you take the next subject? Elvis impersonators. It's something in your genre, I believe. You admire the man, but talk about them. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. <laughs> That's how Elvis Presley used to speak, and of course lots of people make a fortune by impersonating him. He has one of those voices that is quite easy to do, very distinctive, a bit like Tom Jones. Once you've heard it, you know exactly who it is that's singing. Elvis impersonators started to come into their own shortly after the main man himself had died. Suddenly there was a gap in the market. People wanted to hear the old Elvis tunes, but they didn't have Elvis around anymore. New York, New York, New York. So... <laughs> So good, they named it three times. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't say it three times in this round. No. So, Tony, you Just, challenge first. Yeah, and yes. You, you, uh, yes, repetition. Uh, yes. And there are 31 seconds. Elvis impersonators starting now. Well, it's one for me. And a uh, poor challenge. <laughs> Sorry, that was just awful. <laughs> <laughs> It was not only awful, it was a definite hesitation. Absolutely. So, Paul, you have the subject back, Elvis yeah. impersonator. I think we should all... I'd like to hear Clement's Elvis impression, I have to say. <laughs> Maybe gets the subject. You, you got in legitimately. He might have get yet there yet. 29 seconds, starting now. There was a guy who lived in Swansea who was a Sikh, and he was the rockin' turban Elvis. This was back in the 1980s. I remember seeing him. He used to appear on television quite a lot. He was a very funny act. And... A uh, Tony Challenge. Uh, repetition of very... Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, few, yes. Few and there are two varies there. 18 seconds, back with you, Tony. Elvis impersonators starting now. I like listening to Steve right in the afternoon on Radio 2. I know I shouldn't perhaps mention that, but he does have a very good Elvis impersonator on there. There's a little slot called Ask Elvis. And I listen to this, and whoever does it, I don't know who it is. He's quite uh, Paul Challenge. Is there a repetition of listen? Yes, yes there listen. was. I like to listen to uh, <coughs> Steve right in the afternoon, and you're listening again. Four seconds you've got in, Paul, on Elvis impersonators starting Starting now. Undoubtedly my favourite Elvis song. Uh, Clement Challenge. Uh, repetition of song. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's... impressive. The way you buzzed before he said it was fantastic. He buzzed before he said it. He <laughs> <laughs> was determined to get in on this. The man's in league with the devil. <laughs> I think you said we haven't heard from him on this round. He was determined to come in on it. If, if, if Clement can give us an Elvis impression in the last three seconds, I'm very happy to hand the subject over. <laughs> give us an Elvis impression. We haven't got three seconds. 
we've got two seconds. Yes. Do it in two <laughs> seconds. Go on, Clement, start now. Here is my Elvis impression. <laughs> By the way, Paul gets a point because he was incorrectly challenged. You won anyway because Paul gave it to you. You got that point for that, and you've also got a point for speaking or trying to speak when the whistle went. And the benefit of the doubt. No, you didn't. Because <laughs> you didn't do your impersonation. If you'd done your impersonation, you got a bonus point. But you didn't. You missed out on that one. Do, do Eddie Cochran. <laughs> <laughs> but, Clement, take the next round. It's early retirement. <laughs> So, tell us something about that in this game, starting now. I am hugely in favour of early retirement. I retired from school when I was eight, <laughs> went to another from which I retired... Uh, Giles Tallis. Repetition of retired. Yeah. Yes, because retirement's on yes. the card and not retired. So, yeah. Giles, you've got him with 52 seconds on early retirement starting now. Clement and I both faced early retirement when, as members of Parliament, the people spoke. In my case, <laughs> on one same day, 65,000 of my fellow citizens got up with one object in mind. Get that bastard out. <laughs> it was a true form of early retirement, but I took it on the chin. The thing that I missed most, of course, was the House of Commons dining room, where the Conservatives sit at one end of the room and at the other sit the Labour Party members... <laughs> A uh, Paul challenge. We had two sits. You did have two Ooh. sits, yes. 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 Mm. yes. And so Paul listened well. 26 seconds, early retirement starting now. Well, it seems a very fashionable idea these days. People want to retire early, and I can understand why. If you're involved in the rat race, getting the same train every morning, the nine to five, it can be that you sit to the age of around 50 and think to yourself, I want to say goodbye to all that. I shall become a penniless tramp. I shall live on the highways. Uh, Tony challenge. Uh, two I shall. I shall, mm. you see, to right. Yes, you say to myself, I shall, and I shall. <laughs> Definitely don't look like that. They, I must explain that he's trying to bluff me out of it again, but I was listening and concentrating. Nine seconds, Tony, with you, early retirement starting now. I've taken early retirement from five-a-side football. I got sick and tired of people coming up to me and pushing me against that wall that was... Right, so let me give the situation... <clears throat> Tony Hawkes was speaking as a whistle went, and he's doing very well. Uh, he's in the lead. And uh, you're three points ahead, no, two points ahead of Giles Brandreth, three of Paul Merton, and four or five of Clement Freud. And Giles, your turn to begin. The subject is my favourite auntie. Tell us something about that subject in this game starting now. I'm not entirely sure that my favourite auntie was actually my auntie at all. Although we called her auntie and she answered to that name, she was actually a close personal friend of my father's. And I discovered her once in the potting shed examining succulents and cacti with him. And indeed she became my favourite auntie because from that day onwards she gave me the most enormous amount of money on an almost weekly basis. <laughs> under the promise that I would not reveal the fact that I had discovered her and my darling papa with their hoes and their hands dug deep into the beat together because she said it would be a cruelty to my dear beloved mama. Uh, Tony Challenge. I think there was a dear before. Yes, you had no. dear, your dear auntie, it was yes. A bit hard also, I didn't want to hear any more. No. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't seem proper. <laughs> You realise a lot of school children listen to this programme. Yeah, no. Well, actually, what I was realising is my mother listens to this programme. <laughs> Tony, a correct challenge. 21 seconds. My favourite auntie starting now. Well, Auntie Pauline will be listening to this, so I should say that she is my favourite auntie. Indeed, the only one that I have. So that's interesting for you. I'm sure you will be thrilled to know that. Auntie... Uh, Clement Challenge. Repetition of that. That, yes. Nine seconds, my favourite auntie, starting now. Thinking back into my family, anti-disestablishment aerialism <laughs> is the one who brings to mind the longest name, the nicest face, uh, Giles the Challenge. shortest the... Well, there was a hesitation. There was a hesitation after you made his clever remark. Oh, and well, you got in with half a second to go. <laughs> we run a pretty popular game. <laughs> Right, so Giles, half a second. Her right. true name, I have to tell you, was an extraordinary one. <laughs> so Giles was speaking as a whistle when and he's increased his position. He's won a, He's just crept up now. He's one behind Tony Hawks, who's still our leader, and they are three or four ahead of Paul Merton. And, and uh, who else is in playing the game? <laughs> <laughs> 
Tony Hawks, will you take the next round? The subject is newspaper sellers. Tell us something about them in this game starting now. If you think about it, the greatest newspaper sellers are probably celebrities, because without them, would the public really go out and buy these newspapers? I looked at the front page of the Daily Mirror the other day, Rio Ferdinand Love Rat. Could that be important enough to take that place... Uh, Paul Challenge. His voice has just suddenly changed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's getting on his own. Deviation from his normal speaking voice. <laughs> Tony, you can use whatever voice you like, provided you keep going. And there are another 40 seconds. Newspaper sellers are starting now. There they are with their little newspaper stands. The newspaper sellers bellowing to the passers-by. The pedestrians going about their everyday business. Desperately trying to make them have a purchase of their equipment, the stuff they... A poor chance. Desperately making them have a purchase of their equipment. <laughs> they're, 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 it's not equipment they've got. They're, they're selling their wares, their product, not their equipment. We all know I was talking rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> Let's so not rub it in. So, Paul, you've gone yes. in with 25 seconds on newspaper sellers starting now. There used to be a man who stood outside Morton Station every night selling the evening standard, and he would bellow, yip, 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 yip. Are you. Come and tell us. Repetition. What of? You may. No. <laughs> and I recognise that voice. It's you, isn't it? Um, no. I was newspapers outside Morden Station. <laughs> I would say, actually, though it was gibberish, it was, there were not the two. Su- t- there weren't the. T- <laughs> There were not the two same sounds in the gibberish. That's right. Yeah. You know, it's what they used to say. Even if they not your standard... He's you know, doing another one now. It's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that was what the Cockney newspaper sellers used to do. That's oh, at the theatres. Oh, really? You know, when they had the evening news, the evening star and the standard. Evening star and not your standard. Mm. Right. <laughs> were you there when the old Queen died? Yes. <laughs> Are you talking about theatrical queens <laughs> or, or dear monarch? Right. 19 seconds, Paul, with you. Newspaper sellers starting now. The newspapers are a very difficult business to enter if you don't already own one. Every 24 hours, a new issue has to be produced. And for the poor news... Uh, Clement Challenge. Deviation. Why? Not for a Sunday paper. Yes, you didn't establish it was a daily paper you were talking about, Paul. So benefit of the doubt to Clement, and you would last have the subject, Clement. Newspaper sellers, nine seconds starting now. I'm very fond of newspaper sellers because they are, if you look at films or listen to radio plays, always shouting out what appears on the front page. Right, so it's a very even contest, point-wise, in this particular show. Clement Freud is just training a little. He's one point behind Giles, Brandreth and Paul Merton, equal in second place. Tony Hawks is just in the lead. Paul, would you take the next round? It's rubies. Tell us something about that precious stone or that lovely girl. 60 seconds, starting now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you put it in my mind, it was no to talk about the stones or the lovely girl. I was confused. (laughs) No, I, 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 I don't know. You went. So, t- Tony, you challenge. Yes, I don't think he said enough about rubies. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was a second and a half there. Rubies is with you, Tony, and uh, 58 and a half seconds starting now. Of all the girls at my school, Ruby's dress was the finest. Every morning we'd come in, compare all the other ones worn by the other chicks and babes in the playground, but she was quite magnificent in a green outfit that <laughs> shone so magnificently how I loved her. Poor challenge. She's got a green shining dress. <laughs> was it radioactive? <laughs> you can't have a dress that shines. It can be shine. kind of a shiny you dress. You can have a shiny dress. You can have a shiny There's dress. There's a lady over there with a shiny dress. <laughs> it shines out, you know. Does it? Yes. Oh, OK. You could have had another word which you repeated, but I won't tell you what it was. Oh, go on. my job. No, no. Whisper it. And then, <laughs> 39 seconds. We're still with you on Ruby's Tony, starting now. Imagine the dilemma of Harvey Oswald. Should we let the murder go unpunished, or should the revenge... And Paul Charles. We're wandering into that <laughs> special land again, aren't we? <laughs> Absolute rubbish. Paul, benefit. Right, 30 seconds. Ruby's starting oh, now. Ruby's a wonderful, beautiful stone if you get the chance to collect it. Like the name suggests, it's red in colour. If you hold it up to the light, it can make even the greenest dress look like a bacon of darkness. <laughs> Shining dresses. <laughs> Tony, you challenge. 
<laughs> Truculence and sulking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, trying to get back at you, but unfortunately hesitating in the process. 19 seconds. Back with you, Tony, on Ruby's starting up. If I was going to buy a ring for somebody, and it could happen in the future, who knows, I would, in fact, purchase a ruby one, because the diamond is not the thing. <laughs> Charles, Charles. <laughs> were you hesitating? You were, yes, and you've got rubies, Charles, and you've got nine seconds starting now. Rubies are mentioned in the Bible more than any other precious stone. Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid al Maktoum of Dubai. Clement, Charles. I don't believe that. Yes. <laughs> it's true. Well, I, I'm, I'm surprised to hear it. Well, what, yeah. are the, what are the stones mentioned? Now? Gold. No, no, I'm so sorry. All the way through In, the According Bible. to the Guinness Book of Records, <laughs> rubies are the most frequently mentioned precious stone in the Bible. Now, gold, of course, is a metal, but it is not a precious stone, which is what I was alluding to. And I was going to explain that Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid al Maktoum. Right, keep it, because you've just. <laughs> Three seconds, rubies, with you, Giles, starting now. He gave some to Princess Badrul Badur, the most precious girl in all the world. She was so lovely. <laughs> so Giles was speaking as the whistle went gained that extra point. They keep changing position rapidly here. Clement's still just in fourth place behind Paul Merton, and he's two points behind, two points behind Tony Hawkes. And Clement Freud, it's your turn to begin. The subject is the best use for chocolate. Tell us something about that substance and that subject in this game starting now. I think the very best use for chocolate, if you know someone who is taking early retirement, <laughs> is to buy an awful lot of the stuff and give it to her in packages and parcels. Hector Blumenthal, who has a very nouvelle cuisine <laughs> restaurant in Bray on the Thames and puts chocolate into all sorts of very unexpected things like egg and bacon ice cream with a chocolate sauce. He gives chocolate to... Uh, so, Giles Charles. Quite right. I, I think that, so. that yeah. was hesitation. Yeah. 32 seconds. The best use for chocolate starting now. We feed our pussycat Oscar chocolate so that he can sit by the mouse hole with bated breath because <laughs> the rats and the wheels that sink inside the hole... Tony totally challenged. Was there a sort of hesitation? There was a sort of hesitation. Yeah, Enough that. to give it to you, Tony. And 21 seconds, the best use for chocolate starting now. I thought Willy Wonka had a smashing idea for chocolate to build a factory out of it. Uh, Paul Challenge. Well, it was Roald Dahl's idea. He wrote, a, the, he wrote the book, didn't he? He wrote the book, which is a brilliant challenge. We should get, certainly get a bonus point for that. But let's be fair, Willy Wonka did, yeah. in the story, yeah, yeah. decide to yeah. build a chocolate factory. So you have the subject still, but you get a bonus point for your um, intellectual interruption. And... Uh, <laughs> How dare you! <laughs> Fifteen seconds with you, Tony. The best use for chocolate starting now. There was a quite magnificent episode of The Simpsons in which Bart found himself in chocolate world. Everything was constructed of this. What a marvellous use that is, I thought, as I watched it. But, of course, it was just fantasy, not real... <clears throat> <clears throat> So, we are moving into the final round. Oh, oh what a lovely audience. <laughs> I hope that means you've really enjoyed it as much as all that. Um, I will give you the situation point-wise as we do that. Clement Freud trailing a little in fourth place, but it's very close. He's only two points behind Paul Merton, and he's one point behind Giles Brandreth. But out in the lead is Tony Hawkes as we go into the final round, which we're going to ask Giles to begin. I think it's your turn anyway, Giles. The subject is whistleblowing. Tell us something about whistleblowing in just a minute, starting now. As far as I am concerned, the mistress of whistleblowing is actually in the room with us, one of the loveliest creatures in the world. Her name is Janet Staplehurst. I have had the hots for this whistleblower ever since I first encountered her. I have to tell you, this was not just a cerebral thing. This was also to do with lust. This woman has a body that is quite extraordinary. And an embouchure, when her lovely lips approach that whistle, can I tell you, it sends us all into an erotic frenzy. It's the kind of thing that makes Clement Freud glad that he is still alive. Just on he goes, hoping that he can sit next to this creature of loveliness who is the personification and doesn't need a bodice of any kind. No, she comes with her own natural girdle. Who has challenged you? Is this sexual harassment? (laughs) 
It's worship. It's worship. Is it? Have you a challenge when the rules are just... No, I don't, I'm afraid. You don't. I wish I had. You get a bonus point for your interjection there, because the audience loved it. And, uh, uh, Giles, you get a point because you're interrupted. You still have whistleblowing, and 20 seconds starting now. The way she performs her whistleblowing is to be seen to be believed, because the lightness, the subtlety, the way that she does it has erudition and a kind of, kind of mystic charm. Oh! Ooh. Tony Challenge. Yes, a kind of, kind of. A kind of, kind of, yes. Repetition. Well, yes. <laughs> yes. You're getting carried away Take, with your own... This is quite personal, actually. Is... <laughs> I, I think you're having a little sort of... Uh, I am. I am. <laughs> and I, and I'm on the beta blockers as well. I don't know how this has happened. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I know. The Valium will wear off. I know that. Well, I can endorse what you say. I know you can. And we've been fighting it. about it for years. <laughs> I mean, no, you haven't sat next to her as often as I have. I know I haven't. I've been beside her for ten years. I've yeah. got every vibe that you've described. And she's been beside herself for ten years, too. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a repetition, so uh, it was Tony, you got him first. Whistle blowing, twelve seconds, starting now. Over the years, Nicholas has had his whistle blown by the best. But I think we all agree this evening we should pay tribute to Janet Staplehurst on her last evening of whistle... <laughs> I should explain to our listeners that that extra long round of applause was because they're in on the secret. Darling Janet Staplehurst is taking early retirement from the BBC, and this is actually her last show. And so we were sending her off with giles, with, with love and aplomb and ecstasy and all the other words, and you have set her forth now with warmth of applause. We were going to miss her deeply. Let me give you the final score in this edition of Just a Minute. Clement Freud finished in fourth place this occasion. <laughs> Paul Mertner usually does extremely well, finished only in third place. He was two points behind Giles Brandreth. Out in the lead with lots of points and lots of points made and lots of points gained was Tony Hawk. So this week we say, Tony, you are our winner. Thank you very much indeed. It only remains for you to say thank you to these four delightful players of the game, Paul Merton and uh, Tony Hawkes and Giles Branrith and, of course, Clement Freud. And also, again, we thank Janet Staplehurst for the way she's kept the score, not only today, but for over the last ten years. And we thank our producer-director, Claire Jones. We're indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this amazing game. We're grateful to this lovely Devonian audience here in the Northcote Theatre in Exeter. From our audience, from me, Nicholas Parsons, from our panel, goodbye. Thank you for tuning in, but be with us the next time we play Just just a minute!